everybody to the November 29th, 2017 Neshoba Regional School Committee regular meeting. Calling the meeting to order at 6 o'clock. We made it in right at 6. Um, citizens' comments. Do we have any citizens' comments? No. Um, I've got two quickie updates um, for the school committee. One is, I know everybody knows, I just want to state it so that Ann and others can grab this. The budget workshop has been moved to January 20th from the 13th because as um, the 13th falls right in the middle of the long weekend, and while the school committee was willing to do that, um, we were concerned that folks from the public might, who may want to attend wouldn't be able to attend, and I'm sure the principals and other staff members would appreciate that as well. Um, so the budget workshop will be January 20th. And I think it's here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it'll be in the morning, and we'll have more information on an exact time, a start time. It's likely going to take uh, all morning. of the morning. Um, so we'll get back to you on that. Um, and for the school committee, I don't know if you've looked at it, but I reorganized the school committee tab because there was so much stuff in there and so many, um, what are they called? Sub tabs. Alita worked on that for me, like turned it around immediately. So thank you very much to Alita. And hopefully it will help people be able to find the documents that they're looking for much easier, um, both for the school committee and, and the community. And I think those are really the only two that I have. Um, we have a student representative report. Yes, we do. A little bit more exciting than the last. Um, so from the athletics department, our football team will be playing in the MIA Division IV State Championship game this Saturday. Nisha will play Melrose at 11 a.m. at Gillette Stadium. And uh, the pep band is looking forward to performing at Gillette to support the football team as well. Um, winter sports started this week, and the winter season is now in full swing across the district, including the basketball programs at all of the middle schools. And uh, we're excited to report that the Neshoba Pep Rally Bonfire was a success with both faculty, families, and alumni from across the district coming to celebrate Neshoba and get ready for the Thanksgiving football game. Um, from the middle school, uh, the Luther Burbank Middle School Chorus was invited to sing the national anthem at the Worcester Railers um, hockey game on December 22nd. And Florence Sawyer Student Council Food Drive to benefit meat collected a truckload of food checking in at nearly 1,000 pounds before Thanksgiving break. That's it? That's all we have. Really. That's all you have? Yeah. I mean, there'll be more exciting Christmas events in December um, for all the choirs and fans. Things like that. All right. Thank you so much. Can I just bring on the, the bonfire event? Yes. That was so fun. The, what, what a fun, fun event that was. But I think what was really, really special to me was the level of volunteerism and the level of generosity, the donations of time, like whether it was the Lancaster Fire Department or uh, the food trucks that came out and, and the boosters and everything that they did. and. Uh, all of the wood that was donated, if you didn't see that fire, it was like, I don't know, four floors high. It was huge. But the, and the music, and I know our own Mr. Bates, Principal Bates, was our MC that night, did a great job, had the place just rocking. It was fun. It was just a fun, fun night. So special thanks to everyone. Special thanks to our three communities on that. It was great. The students very much enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, we all did. It was fun. All right. You were there as well. I, I was there. I, I, and I dragged my college student there. <laughs> so um, I'm going to turn it over to Superintendent Clenchy for the um, student. For your, for your, for the students? You want to do the students? Yeah, I would say let's do the students' okay. presentation first. Okay. So let's turn it over to Mr. Bates, Principal Bates. Turn it over to Mr. Bates. Hi, everyone. Hi, Thanks very much for having us. Um, I'm going to just tee it up for Mr. Caligiri, the uh, advisor to our investors club. Investors Club started um, actually many years ago as the stock market game. Mr. Caligiri has uh, sort of taken that in the next direction, the next uh, level. We had, uh, I think, uh, some folks, children, were participating in the stock market game years ago. Uh, your boys, Mr. Zakinski, I think. And so it, it's an opportunity for kids to learn about um, finance, markets, economics, and to use. Um, them, uh, to, to invest. And so I'll turn it over to Mr. Caligiri. We have some of our Investors Club members here tonight, Ryan and Curtis and Robert and Trevor. So boys, come on up. Right here, guys. 
Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Oh, is that the clicker? Mm -hmm. Thanks for the opportunity to let us present uh, our en enrichment activity to you guys. The uh, Stock Market Club is, uh, is a lot of fun. And these four uh, gentlemen are just representative. We have 20 kids on the team, um, 10 young men, 10 young ladies, uh, exactly right down the middle, uh, gender-wise. What did you hit the middle? Uh, left and right? Left, yep. So we meet on Monday mornings uh, before school, uh, pre-market, and uh, <laughs> we, it's funny because the platform that we use uh, only allows us to trade. We can't trade pre-market or uh, after the market, um, and there's a lot of fees associated with it. It's something that uh, I wasn't used to because personally I use the Robin Hood one and no fees, nothing. So it was a, a learning curve for me and for and for the students, and. I, I started by first giving a little mini lesson and then letting them go to town, you know, doing some research. But then as kids trickled in, they would miss the lesson. So now I do the lesson at the end, a little 10 minute uh, snippet. Mostly, now that they have their passwords, they get $100,000 to invest. Um, the money obviously is not real, but it's traded in real time, real stocks, uh, real research tools that, uh, that we can use in the platform. Um, we have Chromebooks in the library uh, that the kids can access, and some of them come at lunch, too. Uh, and we compete amongst ourselves and amongst other schools. So I think in our region there are 300, how many, do you remember? There's like 333, 333, just in our region. And we have, I think, nine teams, or ten teams. Uh, Men in Black, the team at Trevor's on, was third for three days in a row at one point beating out um, the Math and Science Academy high school teams and all of that. So, but he'll tell you it, it, there's a little bit of luck involved too. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, skills and we got one more thing here, yeah. And again, it provides, as Mr. Bates pointed out, it provides a great learning experience for the kids. But you know what, they work collaboratively too. I, I, in the beginning, we choose if you want to be an individual investor or if you work on a little team. And most of the kids choose to work on a team, so they learn a lot of collaboration skills. But honestly, most importantly, as the librarian, they, um, they learn a lot about research, too. And there's so much on the internet, especially when it comes to stocks, of people trying to push you in one direction or another. You have to really vet the information to make sure that uh, it's something that you can use. Um, and then again, there's a little bit of luck, too. So, did you guys want to say anything, share anything about what you learned uh, at the stock market? What are your favorite companies that you're investing in? I see they want tips, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so. in that field, so I want to know what you think. Well, and, um, What's been your most successful one? In the Men in Black um, Corporation, we've been investing in Amazon, Google, Apple, all the high-tech um, companies, and they've been pretty successful for us. We've obviously, like Mr. Calgary pointed out, we've been through it for three years straight. And they still stay in the top 20, even though there's fluctuations in the market and other teams. A, group, a whole bunch of teams joined from one school recently and dropped us down only because they hadn't invested yet. So they still had their 100,000 and it was earning interest, you know, before they started. So they bumped some of our guys down a little bit, but we're catching up. I, I would say that. Uh, uh, three of the teachers and myself have a team, Mr. Calgary. Uh, you had to bring this up. <laughs> and, and, well, I think it's important for them to know in terms of context that um, the teacher team is at the bottom of the, <laughs> nearly <laughs> at the bottom of those 360, largely because I um, invested in some fairly risky stocks that have, have not yet paid off. So. Don't dump them yet. But I think the batteries did well, though. Yeah. Yeah. So when you vet stock, what's, what goes into vetting stock and decision making that makes you decide to go in certain stock? Um, we go to get from finance a lot yeah. to uh, help us with the pre-market and uh, with what, we, what this stock did the day before us. So, and we check a bar diagram on uh, like the last day, the last five days, months, six months, and more to see if the stock has been doing well. I see. So for the teacher team, <laughs> what is your vetting process? <laughs> it's not as thorough as my vetting process for teachers, I will tell you. <laughs> 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 um, you see the 
dartboard and Mr. Bates is. <laughs> 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 no, that's good. It sounds. So I'm. Um, so, I I just want to thank you, all of you, and the parents and the kids. Um, financial literacy is like really near and dear to my heart. It is a big deal. And I look at it globally across generations in my day job. I do everything, really do have a job. <laughs> um, but what you guys are doing right now is going to set you up so well for the rest of your lives. Just make sure that um, whatever you can suck out of these guys, you do. <laughs> and then share it with your friends. Because this particular generation actually is more aware the I generation is more aware of financial literacy and the need for it than all of the other generations. So you guys are like truly the future from a financial perspective as well. I think it's exciting. I loved your presentation. Everything you told us was right on. I mean, it was, it was awesome. I want you guys to come back. I want you to tell us how you're doing. I want you to tell us which stocks you tried to take a chance on and you probably <laughs> learned something because it didn't work out for you. And then what I really want to know is, is anybody diversifying their portfolio? Can you, someone talk to me about that? Because I bet you know what that means. Go ahead, somebody who hasn't said anything. Yeah. Chime in. Curtis, come on. What? <laughs> what, what are you holding and is it diverse over different sectors? We accidentally short sold Amazon, so oh buying it. We <laughs> 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 sold it for like three months. <laughs> yeah, we're starting off with the basics. It's open to from for fifth graders to eighth graders, and I'll tell you, I think ninety-five percent are fifth graders. So, and they're all enthusiastic. Awesome. About it. So I think so. I've started it off. We I mean we started off with what is a corporation? What's it publicly traded versus? So every time we add just a little bit more, we just started talking about short selling, but uh, just a l every time it's a, just a little bit more about sec about different sectors and diversify. Um, just starting to get into that. You know, we just started a few months. Just ago. started with but that. But I hope hopefully these guys I know they're going to stick with it throughout middle school too because they're just so enthusiastic about it that as we go we'll start adding those layers because it is a complex uh, yeah. tool to use you know yeah that's really cool does anybody else have any questions for these pretty impressive young men do you have any regrets on any companies that you've had in this mostly uh, Intel sort of because they're not really they're, they've been our, like they're, they're, they were one of our first stocks to buy and they weren't really doing anything for us. So it was kind of a waste of money for us. So at that point did you sell and then look for something else uh, or did you? Yeah. yeah, you did. So you did the swing trade. Yeah. The swing trade. It's <laughs> a 1% transaction fee Ooh. buying and selling. Mm -hmm. So you have to calculate that wow. in. Wow. Oh, it is big. It's huge. That's and, ridiculous. And, and you can only trade at uh, cl at the market close. So, for example, I felt really strong about Wayfair, the online furniture <laughs> market. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. And, uh, and um, you know, thought, uh, and should have known better since, you know, I was pretty well associated with this program, that, uh, you know, we get in at a certain price and it closed much lower and we, you know, we've, we've taken a hit ever since on that, <laughs> trying to get it back. So we have a, we have a, lim a limit order uh, if it ever gets back to that, that golden amount. That is so cool. Oh, I'm so impressed. Yeah. We're, we're so, waiting so for our dividends too. To come <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> we do have some stocks with dividends, a bunch of, I've been trying to talk talk that up well, that's and good you have to wait three months you know before you see some <laughs> results on that and so that's always good I got my Johnson and Johnson that's always a lock <laughs> that's my lock for the I'm for the this one yes he yes, is I talked him into it <laughs> awesome awesome thank you so much thank you guys for coming well, really cool for stop. bringing you tonight that was amazing thank, thank you. you awesome work Talk to them for like an hour. Um, so cool. All right, our superintendent's report is next. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I, I have about six items that I'm going to just quickly race through. Um, uh, Stowe, I, I just want to extend a special thank you to the Stowe Town Planner, um, Jesse Sedman. He, he came in and met with us, met with the team. He met with Michelle Cody. Um, 
Or Rob Fries with Pat, Pat Maroney and myself because they've got a major project going on down there. And I really appreciated the fact that he came early and said, you know, this could affect your busing, so let's just kind of watch it. Here's when we think we're going to start the project. Here's what the type of timelines that we're working on. It was a really nice exchange. So I'm very, very appreciative to Stowe for coming in and letting us know well in advance. Um, grant concerns. I'm going to ask um, Alita if she can um, put put up some of the. We're finding this is can, uh, kind of starting to become a pattern with um, with some of our grants, and so I'm just going to should be there it is should be a separate sheet, um, but it's something that we're continuing to find over and over again. So if you take a look, what we what we were just kind of wanted to point out something that we have to keep in the back of our mind is, for example, the very top SPED program improvement grant, a grant, we've been getting this for years. It's always been about the same amount of money. And so we've been counting on that every single year. And about maybe a week ago, maybe, Joan, would it be maybe two weeks ago? <coughs> all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, the money didn't come and we basically were informed by the DESE, yeah, you're not getting it now. And just like that, almost 30,000 didn't come into us. And we're seeing this kind of trend happening and it's causing us concern. And uh, that, that was a, a really stark example. If you take a look at some of the others, like the SPED Early Childhood Grant there, you can see that that's kind of dipping, not a lot. Um, and then there's another smaller grant that basically just dried up. The kindergarten, is, is that was a big one for us to lose. Now we lost that about a year ago. But it's not like you can just make that up in the next year. It's not like you, you know, you can't take a sixty thousand dollar hit and all of a sudden the next year, gee, it all it's all better from there on in. You're kind of having to work with that year after year after year because there's nothing that replaces that. And um, then the Title One grant, if you take a look at that, we're seeing it decrease. You can see that, you know, the anticipated for two, uh, the, for this current year is the two hundred thirty-two down from three hundred seventeen just two years ago. Um, the circuit breaker is another concern we have, and that's one that we've already been told for 2019 we're going to take a major hit. And so we're already looking ahead to that 2019 year, knowing that we're going to be at least $113,000 out of sync on that grant. And so I, the only reason I bring this tonight was ju is just to say, know that this is happening to us pretty consistently over time. And you have a situation like we did the other, uh, you know, two weeks ago or whatever it was, where all of a sudden, like, I'm so grateful that we didn't sign a, a pile of contracts because that money was all targeted money. And if we signed all those contracts, we would have we would have had to have gone back into the coffers to find that thirty thousand. So, Joan, I'm not sure if there's anything that you're thinking that you can add to this conversation or as I, as I put it out I there. I just think the, the biggest loss is the professional development that comes with that grant. So it gives us a really um, opportunity to provide specialized professional development for special ed teachers in the district and to grow our program. So um, we've used that money for... Um, you know, Orton Gillingham training to expand mm -hmm. reading, specialized reading instruction. Um, last year, we did the co-teaching pilot, um, so we did a lot of work with our middle school special educators and reg regular educators and had consultants coming in, and that work continued this year. Um, so this really specialized money to really, you know, give teachers tools to give cutting edge <coughs> instruction to students who may need, you know, differentiated types of strategies, so it's very concerning. Um, that that money is not available to us this year. I think this whole trend is concerning. And so I want to, you know, last year we talked about how um, we were watching the state and federal <coughs> governments and um, pulling back and, and watching for the pullback mm -hmm. on, on the money. And so what's disturbing to me is not just that this year we've got to try to find a shortfall $113,686,000 in the budget, but for next year, we already know almost that ex exact <coughs> amount is coming out of Circuit Breaker. Right, that's exactly right. So we, and we don't even know what else is going to fall off the table, so you got to assume the losses in the budget now that we know of, and then prepare to assume additional losses, losses when we're looking at wanting to expand programs, add programs, so it's going to be really challenging this year, and we really have to be very 
specific and targeted on the programs that we want to add. This 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 trend makes me really nervous. Well, I think to your point too, uh, uh, you, you're not using the word maintain, but that's really what we're talking about too. Just maintaining those the the PD that we need to, because it's not just about a loss of money; it's a loss of education for, for our teachers that all of a sudden dries up because we don't have the money to, to spend. So it's really, really frustrating and I think I just wanted to put it out there well in advance and just say, just so you know, this is the stuff that we're dealing with right now. So can you keep Sorry. us, one second, can you keep us posted and just keep this? Adding it, yeah. yeah please, Adding just keep us aware. Is this a trend for everybody? Or <coughs> is this, us? this oh, no, all of this, all of this is being felt right across like the state of Massachusetts. It's not, so not just us. So the state is pulling back on all of these. Yeah, I, every, everyone that's you're seeing there. Yeah, I want to go. I want to go uh, back to the top one though. The top one is the only one. And Joan, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I believe the top one is the only one where they're looking at potentially redistributing redistrib it in some different ways. But we've been cut out of the mix. The others though are all basically relative to whatever the budget size is, whatever the needs are, however the whatever the formula is behind it. So that would that's what would be felt in other districts. So is this have they talked about this? Is this something that's going to continue? Or are they just going to keep taking money away from I, We have no idea. We we honestly have no idea. We just get the word you're not getting this. Even though like that twenty eight that twenty seven thousand was something we we have always received that. And all of a sudden we just get a basically an email, and in fact, even the email was just, yeah, you're not getting it. Like, it was like a one-liner, no under, no rationale, no context to understand why we weren't getting it. And then there was something else that said, well, we'll refer you to this, and that's how we were, we discovered that they were going to try to redistribute that. But it doesn't matter for a district like ours because that means that the twenty-seven thousand nine hundred thirty-eight dollars that we thought was coming isn't here. Well, and these are programs that we don't want to impact. But what happens with other grant programs? We're going to have that that may not be um, dictated by law. We're going to have to make decisions, right. tough, tough decisions on do we continue programs. The yeah. priority of those programs. But usually, when they take away, they allow for something. I mean, what are they going to let us do to help supplement this? <laughs> there's there's got to be a, a give and take. They can't just take it away. Absolutely, they can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they can. So they're mandating stuff, but they're not. Absolutely. Management. So. So do they have, but do they have any ideas about like how to help us no. mitigate some of this? We're on our own. Everybody's yeah. on their own. So is there anything that we can't do? I mean, <laughs> well, so you've got to make up the shortfall on the budget. Well, and, and I get that, but I mean, there's so many laws about like what you can do with money, what you can't do with money, and how you can raise the money, how you can not raise the money. Are they giving us any options? No. No. Neil. Um, so just for I think for clarity's sake uh, if, if we could put a face on what these things are because when, mm -hmm. when I think just anybody looks at these including people on the school committee um, unless there's a specific explanation of each one of these particular events SPEV program improvement grant mm -hmm. early childhood grant early childhood program improvement grant right so there's three different things but they all sound very closely associated so where I'm going with this is when people are looking at this this gets posted online or whatever and, and they're showing but it means nothing. Those are just numbers. And, and if there was another column in there that actually gave a very brief one or two word description of what that means, right? So if that means, like John was just talking about, if that means PD, explain that that means PD, that that's the hit that's being taken because I think it needs to have a face on what's going on. Otherwise those numbers are just numbers mm -hmm. and, and it's just a reduction. Mm. And, and I hear all of that, and I'm not disagreeing, and I, and I think that we can certainly add, like I said to Lorraine, I think that we see this as a living, breathing document that we're just creating, and mm -hmm. we'll just continue to add to it. For, um, but, and, and I agree with you on one level, and, and I, so I, I support that thinking, but at the end of the day, when it comes to Pat's office or my office, it is about how do we make up that 113000 right. or whatever number it happens to be there. Because even, even though there's a phase to it, we still have to figure out where that shortfall comes from. So, Mark, on the circuit breaker, are we, do we operate in arrears on that? Do we get money one fiscal year and we use it in the next? Yeah, Pat, maybe right. you can speak to that just quickly yeah, because you're, um, you're absolutely right on that. There's a one-year <coughs> gap here for us. The way that we budget with circuit breaker yeah. is that the monies that we receive, say the money that we receive for circuit breaker this year, 
is used as an, an offset to our revenue source for the following year right. so that we don't get caught in this not kind, of very kind of situation. Right. So we ha we'll have an opportunity to budget according to the numbers that we have right we now. We will have a known number at the end of this right. or during we the will. year right. at some point. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I've also just distributed another sheet, and that's just quickly uh, a, a, an update for the Asabet Valley Collaborative. Um, it, it just lists some of the highlights. Um, apparently, as being a, me uh, being a member of that particular collaborative, um, they ask that we distribute this kind of thing. We're, we're relatively active with the collaborative. I don't think we're overly active with them, but pretty uh, relatively active. Um, we take part in a lot of the PD offerings that are there, of course. Uh, we send uh, certain students to certain programs if that works for us. We are in certain job-alike groups. So those are the types of um, exchanges that we have and the interfacing that we have with the collaborative. So that's just a quick update. Uh, budget process, the new school year budget process continues to progress well. Um, a reminder that we will provide a very brief overview uh, at our next meeting. And I want to remind you that that's simply for the purpose of a placeholder. Um, and it will kind of lend a lens to where we are sitting at effective that night, at that point in time. Remember, it's a snapshot, and we'll probably work down from there, but it's just a, a, a snapshot. Um, Pre-K and K, I just want to acknowledge the fact that, so tonight we're going to start uh, some early discussion on the pre-K. I know that Joan DeAngelis and the principals are going to come forward as, as will Sydney Maxfield and talk about the vision uh, and a, a proposal that they're going to bring up for the pre-K. Uh, next meeting, we're going to have some discussion around K. So this is just for the purpose of starting that discussion. Uh, rental discussions, this is something that has been ongoing for the last year. Um, losing uh, Jeff Converse kind of in the middle of there, we, we kind of put things on hiatus for a little bit. We're letting Rob kind of get his feet wet and, and a little bit more grounded, and then we'll probably bring this back up around February, March type thing for rental discussions. But the group did a lot of good work. A lot of the air, the work is complete. It's just that in its totality, it's not complete enough to bring forward to you. And that's it for me, and I'll be at the football game for uh, Saturday morning. Looking forward to Gillette. <laughs> All right. Um, so Pat, our business and operations manager, um, has a, several updates. And I'm going to take this out of order, Pat, if it's OK. If we could sure. do touch on the FY17 audit report first, and then we'll get into FY18, FY19 budget. Um, as far as the fiscal year 17 audit report, I spoke with um, Deborah Mueller today and you know, find out what the status is. Um, we're waiting for a draft. The draft should be within two weeks. And at that point, they like to present in a draft format to the school committee before they print their final document. Um, in, as soon as I receive that draft document, I will review that and make sure that the numbers are in fact what they should be and then it will be presented to you. So that's the window of time that we're looking for. So for we're going to need to to add that to the calendar probably in yeah. right. February yeah. maybe, right? As yeah. soon as I have a definite date for it, I will make sure that you have it. Okay. We've tentatively put it in a January meeting, but right now we're just waiting to see when we can right. get our hands on the draft. OK. All right. And I have a comment. We should yes. make sure the audit advisory committee is included in the process so that they have comments for the school committee on the audit report. <coughs> so what's your vision on that? Um, they should see the draft. And oh, the well, invite them in, sure. To you know, meet and talk about it and make a recommendation or not, as the case may be. Okay, how about it? Here's the <coughs> Thanks. <I'll> open. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So I have in front of you here um, the uh, monthly expenditure report for the month of November. I mean, for October. Um, uh, we don't have our contract yet um, verified. So that being said, as soon as those salaries have been adjusted, um, hopefully in November I'll have all of those numbers in place and, and we should be able to move forward. Uh, with a, a more accurate, not that anything is going to change dramas, uh, dramatically, but um, yeah, I'll have a little bit more detail for you. Um, 
Does anybody have any questions about this report? Any questions? Anything that we should be watching for? Anything you want to make us aware of? Put it on the radar? <coughs> um, as far as, um, well, not at this point. Okay. But as, the, as the winter continues, we may want to look at some things you know, as far as um, snow accumulation, you know, what they're predicting or whatever. But right now, no. There's no other. There's nothing there. really. <coughs> no. right, you nothing guys good really. with this? All um, And FY19. Fiscal year 19, we are right now um, compiling all of the, the different budgets from all the different departments. We're near completion. Um, we're going to have uh, a document, as Superintendent Clenchy um, mentioned, for um, it's a preliminary document, and it will be ready for presentation on next Wednesday. So um, it, this will not have revenue projections yet. And that's really um, important to know, no revenue projections, because we, as we sit here, it's just so early, we have no idea what the revenue is going to be. Right, like. and we have to wait until we have a bit, quite a few big numbers in that budget. Farms revenue so um, they're state generated and we don't have them. But you'll give us a, a, a look at it before we get to our yes. workshop, which I think is important. Yes. So you'll see Any revenue that we know of by that point in time. Right. Yeah. Okay. So any, you questions? any questions about that? No? All right. So let's jump into um, new business. Um, and we have our Show Regional High School Facility Advisory Subcommittee recommendation. Um, and I think Bob Skansky yes. and his gang, if you guys all want to come up and table to introduce yourselves and if there were members that haven't been able to make it, um, do you want to let you do the intro on this? It doesn't matter. So the charge for this group was to review the documents that had already, the volume of documents. There's a lot of data that's been gathered and analyzed on the high school from from internal groups within the district. Um, and the reason that this group was put together was to determine if we, if you thought that um, a statement of interest was an important step to take. And I'm going to turn it over to Bob because I think Bob can speak to, to this best. Um, thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, the Neshoba Regional High School Facility Advisory Committee initially met on September 25th of this year to consider whether or not to recommend to the school committee that it submit a statement of interest to the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Uh, this committee consisted of two volunteers from each town who applied for the position and one school committee member from each town. In the course of the following weeks, we reviewed the evaluation of the school contained in the 2008 feasibility study. We reviewed the 2016 Neshoba High School Space Needs Task Force final report of 41 pages, the June 2016 enrollment forecast commissioned by the school committee, and the MSBA's 2017 frequently asked questions posted on the MSBA's website. Uh, the following October 30th, just over a month later, the committee overwhelmingly voted in favor of recommending the school committee submit a statement of interest to the MSBA. On behalf of members of the Facility Advisory Committee, I wish to thank the school committee for allowing us to participate in this effort. Thank you. Let's, let's introduce the folks that are with you. Great. Hello, Erica Benedict from Stowe. <coughs> Liz Camilleri from Bolton. Julia North from Stowe. And you had other members who, do you remember who they were? Lynn Coletti, <laughs> oh, from Stowe. And Neil Darcy from Bolton. And Susan Reardon from Lancaster, those are the three schools. And then there was a gentleman from Jay Moody. Jay Moody from Jay Lancaster. Lancaster. Is that it? I think we're good. All right. So your recommendation is? That the school committee submit statement of interest to the MSBA for the high school. All right. So do any of you have anything you want to, to add? Um, anything you want to share with us? Um, Bob, can you help 
people understand what a statement of interest is? Um, well, the MSBA is the Massachusetts School uh, Building Authority. Um, they're paid directly. They get their money not out of the budget, but directly out of the sales tax. And um, they have a very well-defined uh, process that's been in place for years and years and years on how a community can go about engaging with them to uh, renovate or, uh, in, in some cases, if, if you need a new school, build a new school. The first step in that process is a statement of interest uh, in which the school district uh, <coughs> or the town uh, goes ahead and says, uh, we wish to engage, we wish to have the MSBA's help in uh, addressing uh, th these issues within our school district. And the MSBA has, has a list of seven very broadly defined issues that, that they're interested in, in taking care of. Um, the statement of interest is not a commitment on the school district's part. It is just that, a statement of interest. It's there to peak the uh, interest of the MSBA. Uh, the MSBA in turn will follow up on the statement of interest by uh, sending out people to uh, learn more about the school district. Um, it, it does not ask for specific problems. It asks for a broad range of problems. Uh, the MSBA wants to determine the, the scope of these problems on their own. And um, if the MSBA thinks that this is a, a project that they would like to be further engaged in, they will accept the statement of interest and then extend to the school district and offer to engage in a feasibility study. Uh, at that point, there needs to be a commitment of money and manpower uh, if, if the uh, school district wishes to go forward. But the statement of interest is just uh, a response to an invitation to the MSBA to we have some issues we'd like to help you have we'd like to ask you to help us solve them. and to identify what they are and to identify what they are um, so there are no the SOI makes absolutely no recommendations on how any of these problems should be solved it is just a broad statement of we've got issues with some classrooms we've got issues with overcrowding we've got uh, an age we've got some age related deficiencies with our buildings whatever kinds of things um, again the MSB has, has seven criteria and you try to find how many of them you can address in hopes of making this an appealing project to them um, and Again, they turn around to their research, and eight or ten months later, they get back to you as to whether or not they uh, will invite you, extend an invitation to join in a feasibility study. All right. So, does anybody on the school committee have any questions for this group? Do you understand what the statement of interest is now? Okay. Uh, Steve. Yeah. Of the seven criteria, how many? feel that we fit um, as I sit here right now I don't remember all of them but my recollection was last time I looked in on me it was uh, two or three of them two or three can you give us an idea of what those two or three criteria are? I, I think we could say we have age related issues with the science labs in that they're very rigidly arranged you know all the furniture is very fixed and uh, there's some space constraints there. Um, I think there are some issues with mechanical systems. And... Um, windows and roofs, I thought you guys said. Win win well, windows and roofs are kind of the more specialized grants that they have. Um, you know, we, we did have an issue with overcrowding. That was, that was one of them, but that issue's going away. Are we technically overcrowded at the high school now? Because they don't want you to project anything. So if we're, if we're one student overcrowded this year, we can say we've got overcrowding. You I think if you look at the square footage, from what I can remember from the, uh, the task force, if you looked at the square footage, it tells a different story than when you actually look at the way the building is cut right. up and right. the allocation of the space. And it's not like you've got walls that can be moved easily. They're 
cinder block walls that can't be moved. So I think that was part of the issue is it's not that the square footage, mm -hmm. it was the structure within the way the building so the way the is. space is allocated. Yeah. More more than 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 the total square foot. You know, if if um, so you know, the high school to my knowledge has no there's, there's no imminent danger, there's no accreditation issues, uh, which is one of the seven criteria, right? Uh, Concord Carlisle uh, had to address accreditation issues. Uh, North Middlesex had to address accreditation issues. We're not in that boat. So there's some good, some categories you don't want to be in, right? There's no health and safety issues that I'm aware of at the high school, uh, which would be an another criteria. But we fit at least two of those very solidly. <coughs> And, and just for the sake of, um, if, if you ever go onto the Mass School Building Authority website, it's very easy to navigate to find out the information that, that Bob's The, the amount of information they provide is overwhelming. It's phenomenal, yeah. And, and just FYI, too, I, I did speak with them today, and they're um, opening up the statement of interest process first week of January 2018, so. Do you vote? We, uh, yeah, we need, we need to, uh, so basically how this would go potentially tonight, and, and uh, I say potentially because it's totally up to you how you want to address this. Your committee has come forward and given you uh, their recommendation. Now you have to decide if that's something you want to move forward with or not. Now if the answer is yes, you want to move forward, then you need to make a motion tonight to direct me to, pre uh, to prepare the SOI. <coughs> now I can't do that by myself, I mean that's going to be a mammoth undertaking as Bob and I talked about this earlier um, once that SOI is developed then we bring it back to the school committee for a full flight like this very specific language in the motion that has to be to made submit. To, in order to submit it so that's not where you are tonight where you're at tonight is if you're going to direct me to, uh, to start it. the process yeah to, to, to start to prepare the SOI or not mm -hmm. so Personally, since nobody else is doing that, I think we need to do this because I think we need to know from the people that do this every day, day in and day out, and they're the experts, do an evaluation of the building for us, please. I mean, that I know gets down to the feasibility level, so I'm jumping the gun here. But personally, I think we need to do it because We've got, well, we don't really need to do anything. Well, we do need, we need a brand new building. We need to do a renovation. We need to do an addition. We need to bring in more portable classrooms. I mean, I, we, I want the experts to tell us because we've got a lot of people look at it. A lot of people spend a lot of time. Come and tell us what it's going to take, what your recommendation is, and, and then we decide do we want to move forward with the feasibility study or not. But at that point, we know what the options are. We know what the issues are. We know you know, we can discuss are there enough issues that it doesn't make sense for us to take it on ourselves, or are there a few issues that we po possibly could take on ourselves? But we don't know those answers, and I don't feel comfortable not doing anything or just jumping in to do something. I want the guidance, so that's where I'm at. Anybody else have any thoughts? Lynn, I know you do. Oh, I sat through all that. <laughs> No, it's a, it, it doesn't cost us anything. It um, gets us in the process, and we always have the option to say no. Yeah. So I mean, at this point in time, it's a no-brainer until we start. Anybody else? I would be interested in seeing some of the documents that the committee reviewed. Um, they're not online, so I would like to just get a sense of Kinds of things they looked at. So the things that I'm, they looked I'm at. I'm surprised to hear that because they were online a month ago. Yeah. All of the so documents, we'll go, we'll go the back old feasibility look. study, and all that stuff was available. It was online. all online. It was the NEASC study. It was the space uh, study task force, and the former feasibility so study that we done years ago. Okay. So Mark, I looked this morning, and all the really? were minutes, minutes, and agendas. No, Mark, it's under the old task force tab. Oh. So it's beyond in the, in the previous committee's page. But it's at the bottom of the, the, the current committee's yeah. tab. It's There's at the bottom of okay. There's a tab that leads it to the next page. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
All right, so I know I just wanted to take a moment to thank thank the committee too for that was a lot of work, that was a lot of reading, a lot of very rich discussion. I'd like to point that really? out too. <laughs> very, very rich discussion, and um, I'm very respectful of, of the fact that you took a lot of time out of your lives to come in and do that and discuss the topic so thoroughly, so so thoroughly. So you folks looked at the documents, and you folks walked the building. So are there any? Is there anything as part of the committee that you want to add? I'm not trying to force you to speak. I think it would just be helpful. It was, it was an easy decision for me after I, uh, I read all the documents and then by the time the tour was finished, it was very clear to me that, um, that there was a need to do something, which was all that we were asked to do is decide whether or not something was needed to be done. And that was absolutely clear to me. Easy choice. And someone, I don't remember, Lynn, it might have been you, someone used the analogy of doing a home inspection. Of you have this building, and what, I mean, maybe it was Lorraine who said that, I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry. No, but it just, it, when you, when whoever said that said that, I was like, oh, of course, we own this building, and of course we want, like, give us the laundry list of what's going on, and then make an educated decision. That helps. Julianne, share with us, with us your thoughts. Um, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think the committee voted. Okay. Made the right decision. All right. So given that, does somebody want to make a motion? Um, I move that the school committee authorize the superintendent to complete the MSBA statement of interest form. Okay. And do I have a second? Second. Elise, anybody have any questions? All those in favor? Oh uh, yes, I do. Okay. Did this advisory committee examined the various other strategies oh, towards um, improving or repairing the high school. Did it look at self-financing as opposed to engaging with the state? That really I don't understand what, what we, we, we didn't yeah. look. We didn't look at any remedies. <coughs> we didn't look at that any remedies. That wasn't the charge. Yeah, that wasn't the charge at all. Uh, no, no rem We did not look at any remedies. And, and, and that's in line with what the SOI does. The SOI does not ask for any remedies. It doesn't ask if you want to build. It doesn't ask if you want to renovate. It doesn't ask anything about money and costs. So what we looked at was, was in line with the question of, of the statement of interest. And I think we need to know what we need to know. Right. And, and we're not, none of us are going to pretend to be experts. I mean, we can only look at the information that we have that's been presented to us through multiple years of uh, space studies task force and feasibility studies, every, everything else that's out there. Um, and just find somebody who has that expertise to bring this forward and say, hey, here's some options. I mean, I don't know, I, I think something needs to be done. And I'd be shocked if anyone walked through there and could honestly walk out saying nothing needed to be done. What needs to be done, I don't know. I mean, right. it could it could be just you know a few things here and there that would take care of the situation, or it, it could be much more drastic than that. I just don't know, and I'm not going to pretend, and, and I don't think anyone, honestly, is qualified on any level um, around this, you know the, the, any of the groups that have got together to make that decision. Okay. It's a question. Do we want to add just to ease everybody? This is coming back here for a final vote. Once, once the SOI is done? Yeah, we don't need to add it to the motion, but it will have to come back here because that the motion is just to direct the superintendent to, to prepare the SOI, then not to vote on it again. Okay. And then the, the language is like a block like this if okay. we end up, uh, well, yeah. right. So, yeah, we're not it's there. It's very prescribed language. Good. All those in favor of submitting the SOI? Well, not preparing. Preparing, <laughs> yes, I. Thank you, Mark. It's unanimous. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you well, very, thank very you. much, guys. I appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is the Unit A contract vote, but we are not prepared for that tonight, so we're going to table that to um, an upcoming, quickly upcoming meeting. Um, and we've got two presentations tonight, um, one on pre-K and one on technology. So I'll turn it over to the superintendent. Sure, and I'll have the, the, the folks that are presenting for pre-K come and join us at the table. You probably have to drag your chair here too. So, um, 
we'll, we'll introduce the uh, folks at the table as soon as they get here. No worries. So at the table before you, um, you have Cindy Maxfield, uh, our coordinator of uh, early education, Joan DeAngelis, our uh, director of pupil and personnel services, Principal Joel Bates, Florence Sawyer, Principal Ross McCarran, uh in, in Stowe in Central School, and Principal Sean O'Shea um, at uh, Mary Rowland Center. Thanks for coming in after a full, full day in your schools. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, tonight we're gonna uh, we're gonna start the discussion, uh, but I'm gonna tee it up a little bit because I want to tee it up um, very similar to how we would tee up the K discussion, a and that is that we're really not here to talk about money as such. So I want to kind of put that on the table first. What what we found is we had to really make sure that we come to terms philosophically with. Um, where we stood in terms of both pre-K and K. And by the way, these were very different discussions. Um, there was a little bit of intertwining of the, the two, but for the most part, they were pretty separate discussions. Um, we talked about structure. We talked about the structure that we could see uh, district-wide and in, inside of each building. We looked at how it differed, uh, could differ from this year to next year. Um, we talked about changing the focus and what the focus really is for pre-K because the focus for pre-K is definitely different than the focus for K. And so it was a case of kind of bringing that all together. I think at the forefront of all of our work, all of the time, is what's in the best interest of children. And so that sat on the table front and center. The other thing, and I know uh, Ross will often tease me about this, is I'm always looking for consistency across the district so that it doesn't matter where your child goes to school inside of Neshoba Regional School District, they are getting basically the same thing no matter what community they're in. So that's very important to us. Um, I want to also put out there that this is probably the only real uh, link to, to money is that again this year, even as we're watching um, the expenditures and the revenue for our, our pre-K, the fees themselves don't cover the program. We need to make sure that we say that again. The fees don't cover the full cost. The school district, in essence, picks up the balance on that. <coughs> so I, I just want to put that out there as well. So I'm going to, to tee it up with, with Joan starting. But the fact that you've got your entire team in front of you should send a message um, that they are speaking from one lens uh, this evening. So I, I will make sure that you're all speaking at some point in time, but I, I think, Joan, if you can start us off, and then if, there, if you, I feel you're leaving out any holes, I'll quickly work to fill it in. Thanks, thanks for having us. Um, we have done probably a three month long study to really look at our preschool programs, and I think that I was here <coughs> early in September and there was really a question about the difference between regular ed preschool and special ed preschool and what the requirements are. So, you know, I'm here to say that integrated preschool, um, we are required to do. Um, preschool programs really to serve with our special needs students and give them an opportunity um, to provide, to get a, a few things, academic instruction, related services, because we all want kids to have a rich experience and come to a level playing field when they come to kindergarten. So we had a variety of pro we have a variety of programs in place, and I think what we um, dug into was what does our program look like, what is the definition of our program, and what is our mission. So um, we um, this year currently we have two, three, four, and five half day programs, and we have five day preschool programs. So we just looked at that model that seemed to be an awful lot, and we started to really do some research about. What's the difference between two half days and three half days? What's the difference between four half days and five half days? We found some real similarities in terms of how we were providing services to students, and we felt like it really made sense to really consolidate what we offer and have less options and more a more thoughtful approach. So um, we worked on a, um, a new brochure, which you all, I hope, have in front of you now, um, to really talk about what our mission is, what the goals of preschool are, um, kind of what the day in the life of a preschooler is, um, 
and on the back really talks about program options. You have a sample, um, just so there's more language for you to have. Of what, do, what do we do on a three half day program? What does a five day half day program focus on? And what are two, um, our two full day pre-school programs focus on? And obviously we make recommendations based on what students need when we're in an IEP meeting based on intensity supports related services that students need. So um, we're here to say tonight that we think that we should have three half day programs, um, a five half day full, um, program and two full day five programs. We think consolidating makes more sense. When we looked at the differences between the two and three half days and then started to really factor in um, you know, snack and recess and related services, really how much preschool education time are kids getting in a two day. So we really thought that the recommendation should be three so they could get some more of that rich um, instruction that we provide. I, um, I would say the same of the four half day and the five day. For students who really need that structured support, coming to school every day, getting them prepared for kindergarten is really important and it really gives them an opportunity to build social skills um, and have the consistency of structure of a like similar to a K program. So that's one recommendation we have is to really consolidate our offerings and think about how we provide comprehensive services that make sense. Um, so um, I have you know the detailed description of what we think mm -hmm. students need that you have in front of you. Um, the other thing is we, we talked about what is our enrollment. So we looked at the enrollment over the last three years. Um, our model seems a little bit blended between a regular ed program and a special ed program. And so what we found was our programs were um, undersubscribed um, for special ed students. So there is a slide. They have it on there. Oh, you have it. OK. Um, it, it, it's the sheet that should look like this. It's in the no, it's in the packet, sorry. Okay. So as you can see above is kind of what we have currently at each school center, Florence Sawyer and Mary Rollinson. So you want to look this way. Joan pointed out it's both alphabetically and geographically. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joel. Um, so if you look at each of the programs, you can see um, how many, you know, we typically have five special ed students with 10 role models. Um, with the exception of Center School, they have one model that is seven special ed students and eight role models. Um, but if you look across, both our special ed um, slots are very minimally um, filled. And you know we do have some openings in terms of our regular ed role model slots. Um, so right now we have 29 special ed slots across the district that are filled. We have 29 slots open, um, and our total slot availability is 58. Um, when you look at our role model slots, we have 97 regular ed students um, coming into our preschool program. Um, we have 13 slots open, and the total number of slots is 113. So if our focus, which I think it is, is an integrated preschool for special ed kids, we stop thinking about what are our program needs. So this is what we currently have, and this is what we're proposing that we need. So I want to talk a little bit, because I think I was here last night, to talk a little bit about alignment of programming. So one of the things I'll tell you is in Bolton right now, um, Mr. Bates has no links in his building, um, which really is a preschool program, and the students then go down to MRE to Mr. O'Shea's um, building because he has links one. So our students have high needs, and I don't like to move our highest needs students a lot. I don't think that's good. I don't think it's good for planning. And when I think about articulation between staff members, I think it's better if the programs are in one location. So why are we moving our needs mm -hmm. students the most? I think part of it was a space issue. So when we put the program here, honestly, it's because obviously school districts were always looking at classrooms. So one of the recommendations is actually to move Little Links from 
Bolton to MRA so that when students are, you know, they're getting used to the building and then they don't have to leave and re-familiarize themselves with another building. So that there's kind of that thoughtful strand that I talked about um, last time I was here in terms of our elementary programs. Um, and I would say the same of um, MRE has the, uh, has a program that really belongs at in Stowe um, at Center School. So we would move that program, and that's our Beginning Connections program, which would be our preschool, and we just opened, as you know, Class Connections. So in terms of continuity of service and providing, we're moving kids less by having them start in the buildings, and if they need that level of service, they stay in the same place, and teachers are able to coordinate and um, talk about students meaningfully and thoughtfully, and we're doing you know positive transitions without making them move from buildings. So, um, and then we have um, Sunrise. So those are the kids that really need um, a structured five-day program for consistency, routine, social skills development, and that would be here in Bolton. So those are kind of the setup of our five-day programs, but just so you can kind of see the path going forward um, makes sense so kids don't have to move as often. So that's one thought process. The other thought process is that we would have four three half-day programs, um, two in Lancaster, because we have a, we would have a substantially separate program, so we would want some role mo model opportunity in the morning and the afternoon for students to be able to participate with role <coughs> models. Um, and then two half-day, three-day programs, one at Center and one in Bolton. So that's like a lot of information, right? No, it just actually, I mean, I'm going to, when you guys are, I'm going to ask these folks to talk, it just sounds like it's a thoughtful, structured, from the, from the needs of the student, <laughs> the student that these programs are supposed to be designed for. So I, I, I really do like that because I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not well versed. Um, I do have a quick question though, in the current structure, you have 29 special education slots filled and 29 special education slots open. So my question is, we have those open slots, what happens, do those slots have to remain open so for the balance of the year? They do because those are the classes that exist right now in the district. Right now we have 11 sections of preschool that are open and, I, and I'm, I'm not sure we need that many yeah. for uh, integrated special education preschool. So you've got 40 slots that are currently open and not being utilized and, and what, three quarters of them are for the kids that this program is intended for. That's right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So in the new bottle, what we did was we reduced the number of slots by age. When we looked at projections across the year, we, we've run between, in the last three years of uh, preschool students, between 28 and 37 students. So obviously we want to be careful. We don't want to have not enough slots and then realize that we need to open a section. So we want to be careful and thoughtful about that. Um, but in the new model, um, there's a significant reduction in terms of what would be available for slots for role models um, significantly. So I, I want to mention that. You know, I'm sure that that's um, noteworthy. All right. Do, um, do you folks, before I ask the school committee, do you folks have anything you want to add about the proposal? I, I, I think it was, uh, you know, I, we've been part of the work. Um, and, it, and I think <coughs> it's time for us to look at all of the different, it, it creates some inconsistency in terms of what we offer in, you know, the Florence Sawyer School Center, Rollinson, and, and to have, you know, more of a, a consistent approach. Curriculum is the same, but you can see from the chart in the current proposal that there are a lot of different configurations of how that lays itself out, and, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that can be tough if there are, you know, slots filled in one town and then they're coming in and then you're trying to sort of um, make that timeline fit when you don't necessarily have a class set up. So for consistency's sake, I appreciate this work. 
I think I would add just, <coughs> you know, as the least senior member of the, the principals group here, understanding over the last couple of years what the difference, you know, not only within center school, the difference between a two day and a three day half day mm -hmm. and what dictates the needs for a student to be in that, but then looking across the district where we have two day, three day, four day, and, um, you know, five day, five day or full day, but what the difference is for the needs of the student, I think the, the work that Jones done to build consistency, and I'm also excited about the idea of, you know, of putting in, you know, the beginning connections strand mm -hmm. at center, which could lead to the current class connections which we're building. So while it's still very, it's, it's a young idea at center, and I think the long-term effects are very impactful for the needs of the students that we're trying to address that we haven't been able to over the last several years. Um, so it's a, it's a district resource, but I think it works well. That, what you just said is really key, right? It's something we've been trying to address and we haven't been able to. So right. you're looking at it, and I've, <coughs> I've not talked with these folks, I just want to make sure everybody knows, <laughs> but you're looking at it more, um, I don't want to say creatively, much more innovatively based on the needs of the student, but in a way it's just so simple. It just, you know, it's like the simple, it's the simple <coughs> ideas that generally are the best ideas, but um, I think that's really important what you said. Sean? I don't really have any no? more to add. I mean, I think the you know, shifting of the, the Little Links program would be with us makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, terrific for the students. I think, you know, I've been here a long time, but I haven't seen all this data in one place. I think that really, it, it gives you a, a really good perspective of what's going on, what, you know, we have open slots, how we can do this more effectively for the students. Um, so I, you know, I appreciate kind of dialoguing this and then, and then seeing it all in one place. It's awesome. All right, I'm gonna ask school clear, I'm gonna, what I wanna hear from everyone I think is just kind of important. So, That's Cindy too. Um, and Cindy, I'm sorry. Sean, I don't have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> it's all been said. I'm so sorry. That's okay. All right. Elise, what are your thoughts? <laughs> you tune in to me because I, I work in special ed. Um, no, I I mean, this all makes sense to me. And, and, and sort of as when Joan was here before talking about having alignment between programs and not moving students around makes a lot of sense to me. Um, it does, you, so we are, we would be cutting, or you would be cutting the program like in terms of size quite significantly. What do you think the impact of that will be? I mean, in terms of how many, sorry, I'm, clearly I need glasses. No, it's <laughs> small. <laughs> it's, it was hard to get this all on one sheet. <laughs> um, so right now, you know, obviously there's quite a, a big difference in the number of students. You know, it's a much smaller group of, of special ed students and we're talking 97, you said role model right. slots mm -hmm. filled and you're talking about cutting that down to 48. Mm -hmm. And that will balance things a lot more, obviously, you know, when you're looking at how you spread it out. But, you know, are we consistently kind of turning kids away as it is for these role model slots? Or? Well, well we've, we've got empty slots. There's empty slots. Yeah, there's right. like 10, right? 13. 13. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm getting yeah. at, finish like, your thought, so we'll go ahead. No, um, no, I'm just thinking about, you know, when I was sending my own kids to preschool and doing the lottery, um, and to me, it was, as a parent, it was really important to have them be, start at MRE at preschool so that by the time they got to kindergarten, everything was familiar, they knew these kids, these kids were their friends. Um, you know, and we were fortunate that we always got our first choice and what we wanted. <laughs> we got good lottery numbers. But I'm wondering what the impact will be on families who may not be able to get slots in you know, that, and obviously they're not the first priority because this is an integrated preschool, but it also is nice to have all of our children be together from the beginning um, as a parent, you know, and, and get to know, you know, I'm glad that my kids got to know kids in the integrated preschool and now they, you know, these kids are very familiar with them. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I'm going to toss it over to Susan. I, I think it's great that it's, that it's based on student needs mm -hmm. and you, and I, and I really, um, I appreciate when my older daughter was in preschool. I think it had just started the integrated preschool, and it was valuable then. I think, and I, I think it still is. And to keep that as the focus of the program, I think, 
makes the most sense. There are, there are, I understand what you're saying, but I think there are other opportunities for private, um, yeah, you know, private schools for them to meet kids from the area or the town. You know, so I, I think it's a great. And shift. I'm going to jump to Kathy. I'm, 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 I'm asking the folks on the school committee who have educational background, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then we'll get to those of us that are lay people. Now I'm going to go to the boys in a minute too. But um, Kathy, um, what do you think? Well, I, I appreciate the thoughtful approach to looking at this and looking at data to make a decision, um, because it, it really was a concern to me when I saw uh, this information for the first time last year and saw that. You know, the integrated preschool is intended as a special ed program with mm -hmm. adding uh, to move students to it. And you have two classes there that don't have any sped students in them at all, but you have 14 yeah. well, So it just seemed like it wasn't the best way to put a program together. And um, I understand that in an ideal world, we would all the um, students that live in three towns to be able to go to preschool at your school, but I think the, the intent is to have an integrated preschool, but to make it work um, programmatically, but also as cost effectively as we can. I think it's great that, that, that you've thought about the transitions and it makes sense the way that it is set up. So I guess um, my, my question has to do with when people, like a, a, a typical student, accepts a, a, a spot, is going to spot, are they guaranteed that they will go to the school in the town where they live, or is that, mm. so it could be anywhere across the district? Okay. okay. I, I think. Thanks. I'm curious, what is the general um, mandated portion of you know, model students to um, special students what, and what is the range that you've experienced in your professional models in that score? So the law says that um, mm -hmm. we can have seven special ed students to eight role models. 51-49 is the percentage rate um, and that's kind of what we have um, proposed. Mm -hmm. We also could go to a model um, where they allow us to do five special ed students to 15 regular ed um, students, which is a class of 20. And I think we've talked about the management of that many students in a preschool and how well do we service mm -hmm. kids that are three and four with a class size of 20. I think that's why we've recommended this ratio. And is it hard to predict the number of um, special ed kids that are coming forward each year? Is it really kind of just wait and see and you we have to look at trends over time so we looked at a three-year trend so yes I think it's hard to predict you never know who's going to move in you know we can you know look at how many um, students you know based on the census um, live birth rate but if we looked across the district um, you know when we said you know 15 percent of kids um, that's we're about 15.5 identified students that have special ed, so um, I would say preschool is pretty consistent with that. You know, some years have been a little bit higher um, where we're providing services, and then the earlier we provide the service, obviously, then sometimes kids don't need services later. So, you know, sometimes the numbers can be a little bit inflated, but that's our job is to do things early and do them well. Okay. Lynn? Um, been doing a lot of reading since kindergarten came up, <laughs> and I'm I'm actually thrilled that pre-K is going to be servicing what its intent is, is what it sounds like, um, because everything I'm reading says it all starts with when they enter. So yeah, I'm, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Wow, you got a thank you out of Lynn Coletti. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it? <laughs> What's the date? <laughs> Woo! <-hoo! laughs> this, this is small. I'm sorry. Steve, what do you think? I like the I like the idea that we're consolidating the, ch the number of choices in each location and uh, spreading spreading the uh, students, you know, basically fairly evenly across the program. I think that's that's good. Uh, I I remember we kind of did the same kind of thing for K, 
Um, before the school started, we talked about the first school year started, we talked about that and balance. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're able to balance it out yeah. and utilize the resources more uh, more efficiently. And I think this will move us in that direction as well. Mm -hmm. So, I'd like, yeah, I think I'd so too. Like it. And thank you for working on it. Yeah, this mm -hmm. chart makes it so clear, doesn't it? It is. Yes. Really yeah. Yeah. Even for of me. course. Oh. <laughs> and, um, and I saved the best for last. That's on camera. <laughs> um, so, coming from the total non, like, it, this is like the layperson approach, um, it just seems that this is a much more holistic um, approach to the program. And if I understand integrated, I mean, we have an integrated program. We don't have a pre K program. We have an integrated pre K program. And, and I understand there's a difference between the two. The integrated is to deal with the special needs students as the primary resource, providing the role models um, or whatever is that what you call them? Yes. Role models, yes. To work with it. So I personally like the idea. In uh, this is layperson, but the one-to-one -one ratio, because you know I, it, it just I think provides more exposure for the children to interact with each other on a more consistent basis. Um, now that being said. You know, this has been a district that's that's always had a very grounded and well thought of um, reputation for special needs and the, the ability to address that. And I think that this takes that to another level uh, at this point in time because we really are focusing on what we should be focusing. Thank you. Wow. Anything else? Um, I'm going to toss something out there um, because I, Elise, I, I have one other small question. Yeah. Um, just with regard to so this year we have 29 special ed and 29 that were empty, and with the proposed, you know, clearly we've never really, or at least in this chart, hadn't haven't had an issue with filling the role model slots, but if we're proposing 48 special education <coughs> slots, do we think? we're going to fill those 48, or is it going to be similar to what it is now, where all 48 role model spots get filled, and you know we've got 29 or so, so there's still a bunch mm -hmm. of empty special ed slots, and then we're not having that parity you know, here in terms of sort of what Neil was just saying with the one-to-one. -one. I mean, right. it's coming a lot closer, I think and we're, we're not ending right. up with this you know, right. zero and 14, yeah. but. Yeah. Right. So yeah. one of the things I want to say is if you look at our five full day preschool, that is really, um, an intensive classroom mm -hmm. program. So six of those slots are represented there. So you know that brings us down to really 42 okay. um, in terms of numbers that we have available. I don't want to call it too tight. We can't always predict the future. Right. As you know, we've had as high as 35, 36, 37. So I think we need to be careful to have enough slots so we're not coming back saying we need to create another half day program. Mm -hmm. I, I want to be careful about that. I think that, you know, um, and six of those slots are really dedicated to that intensive program. So that really brings us to 42. Um, I didn't want to cut it any closer than that. And, and I think it's always it's important to know, we don't know until like we're right, until this time like of the <laughs> year, they say, oh, okay, this is what happened, you know? Um, so I, I would agree with her. I, and I think, I, I'm not sure who, I think maybe the, uh, was Chairman Lawasco. we've been really, really thoughtful about this process. Mm -hmm. I personally, and I said that to them today, you know, um, I feel really good about where we've landed here because I do believe that we've, we're putting the focus where it needs to be. And I, and I do feel that this, this model will be more effective from that lens. So my question, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do this because I know I, I, and again, I don't do what you folks do. Um, so let's assume we have 48, um, and you probably already know the answer to this, and you do too, and you do too, and you do too, but um, you have 48 um, special ed slots. And you we're this time next year, and there's 24 kids, which means there's 24 special ed slots that are still open, which we need to preserve in some way for children who may move in. Mm -hmm. um, would we not want, I don't even know how to say this, this might not be, I, would we not consider bringing in a couple of reg ed kids into those open slots 
in order to allow some of those families who would like to so one of the things that you know certainly is an option I think our three-day programs we're not going to have a hard time going you know just be with, either with either student with either student when we look at our five-day programs um, you know we, we could have less special ed students we may not have seven and if we see over the course of the year that we're not going to fill those slots we could build and do the role model slots and have you know five special ed students with ten role models so we could expand that way yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay and I think that's something that we look at even with the current programming mm -hmm. um, okay that we have but now. making sure that we leave some open. we have we to leave some well open. the integrity of the program is really about mm -hmm. special ed student right. I mean I, I like this warms my heart because this is what we should be doing um, serving those kids yes so um, with open special ed um, slots would we ever take a, a tuition kid from another town I think if we appropriately could serve another student from another town yes mm -hmm. Does that fall into, um, would that make our no. long-term <coughs> It's a tuition, it would be it's tuition. very, very it's different pay mm -hmm. tuition for each other. Yeah. We've done it. Yeah. We've done it. I mean, we have Little Links. It's a highly intensive program. It's very specialized. You know, not all districts around are able or have a population of students to provide. Yeah. Um, and they have sought us out to do that. So I think okay. that we need to make sure, though, it's a right fit and they right. have to feel like it's a right fit. And, exactly. you know, we kind of relook at it after the preschool years are over. Okay. All right, Neil. It, do, it, it has to do with what Elise and we were both talking about numbers. Um, so I think the disappointing thing for that program is to see, like, <coughs> zero. Ooh children in, in 10 and so we, we could end up and is there something to keep it from happening again in other words so yeah okay we take that scenario where there's 24 slots but that doesn't mean we make another class or two of 0 and 12 or something like that right I mean if we would right. figure out some way of integrating that so that it, it wouldn't end up like that is that the plan right yeah I, I think we're, we want to take a very thoughtful lens to, to the um, complexion of that class moving forward so I, so I would agree with you and I think we do that well at IUP meetings to begin with we really look at what are the services and needs and where the best where is the best spot for that student to get that service so sure. I think we're careful about that we're looking at numbers and talking about that along with you know, staffing and support okay Kathy so we're going to wrap it up after yeah here. this this represents a change and so what is the plan for a rollout in communication because if previously we had um, over a hundred slots mm -hmm. for role model students and it's going down to 48 mm -hmm. um, people will want to look for the preschool opportunities for their children sooner yes. rather than later yes. so right. that's the so if you're comfortable with this model and you're um, approved, you know, approve this model, I think the next step would be to notify families of kind of what is what's going to be available and are they interested. We have some kids in a two-day program, some in a four, some people don't want a five-day or don't want three days. Mm -hmm. So I think we would send letters to our returning students to see what, you know, mm -hmm. what they were interested in mm -hmm. and let them know that we're going to a new model format. When does, when do, the, when do, the, okay, so this sorry can I get the words up when typically do the letters go from when do parents typically I don't remember it's been a couple of years the um not the, ours because last year we uh, did not handle that well but when do um, parents typically start looking for preschool opportunities well Thank they're you. looking That's now because and um, usually registration is in January Oh, okay. Okay, that makes sense. So we need to, we need to have an answer mm -hmm. by December. Right. We have sent out even um, information about our preschool in December, letting people know we would be having a registration in January. Under this, with this, we probably won't need a registration. We'll have enough slots for the children returning next year. Oh. Only. 
if they all decide to. I was going right. to say, we want to be right. cautious on how we say that. Yeah, right. 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 We're, we're really not, again, we're really not sure, but you're, but that's something that we have had discussion on as, as a group. So okay. your point is well made. All right, Neil, quick. That, that is actually a question I have on the phasing. So you have some children who might be two years in the program. Mm -hmm. how, how is that all going to play out? Do you know what I mean? So if you've got kids that are two years in the program, does that mean that you have, um, and I'm talking about um, regular ed students, mm -hmm. so how does that affect the actual slots that might be available? Um, and um, yeah, Would you guarantee them a the slot for right, the following year? Right, and is it phased in? Because that could be really disruptive too, if that's not, you know, if you... I, I so I does that get some... If it, we end up without a slot for something, that's what right. I'm saying. Uh, it doesn't, according to these numbers, it looks like we'll be able to yeah. accommodate all our returning children because we've done the numbers on how many will go to kindergarten next year. Mm -hmm. However, okay. we won't yeah. have spaces beyond that unless some of the children choose not, or families choose okay, not. Okay, so we're not that. displacing kids. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> that comes with the timing thing, though, so that those people in my mind, do you have an earlier time that they should be letting you know that before the registration process so that they aren't, you know, so people aren't registering and then finding out, oh wait, there is a slot that's there, because then it's going to run into that whole big debacle again. We would do the same thing, like a lottery process, like last year we did, you know, a commitment to our three-year-olds and the four-year-olds that are coming in. Obviously, we don't make them go through the lottery, so they're guaranteed a slot. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in this new model, because we don't have as many options, we need to say, <coughs> what, are you interested in a three-day versus a two-day model or a five-day versus a four-day model? Um, and then we'll, you know, if to we make have decisions from there. If we have too many children, say um, everybody wanted the three-day or everyone right. wanted the five-day, right. that's when we go to a lottery. lottery. Even right. with the children in our program, we've done right. that in the past. But you're vetting this at an earlier date, though, so that mm -hmm. the normal registration process isn't isn't tweaked or affected by that, right? right. So all the current are. So when do they okay. 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 So when do they actually okay. commit to? In January. January. So they actually Guys, we got to get it together. There's a lot of chatter. Go ahead. Are, are you are you? Well, actually, when do they actually commit to going? I mean, do they? In they January. actually have to commit in January. Yeah, year? we would say, well, well we have done in the past, we send a letter and say, are you coming back next year? In which program do you want? They check it off. If we have too many returning students wanting the same classroom, we, we, that's when we go to a lottery for them, saying, well, you know, you can't get into the three day. Right. Has it always right. been like that? Yes. Okay, so, right. so, the, right. so that's yeah. not going to be so different. different now, okay. so. All right, so I think um, I need to know what you folks want to do, school committee. Um, do we have to move to accept it? Well, what do we do? well, I guess there's two questions. Um, you've, you've, you've kind of all stated where you feel on this. It does require a vote. Are you prepared to vote tonight? Do you want to wait? Um, uh, for what? <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm concerned about, I'm, I'm concerned about <laughs> people being aware. This is, of course, is news. Right. 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 And so if people are anticipating all the slots are available right. and that's not the case, then they need to know sooner rather than later. Well, that's, yeah. I mean, the communication plan for this has to be really tight because um, right. we didn't know. Yeah. for approval. The, right. Yeah. That's right. Right. So, so, oh, so your suggestion is to, to go ahead and, I'm, I mean, I'm anybody ready. can throw a motion on the floor. My, my question is why do we need a motion to do something that falls within the superintendent's it, You're completely changing these programs. This program is completely different. I'm, I'm wondering if, because of what happened last year, are we needing next week? Yes. yes. So I'm wondering if we should Right. Move it to next week so that people can come in and have their say, and then we can right. make the vote. And that's where um, so I, I, I'm. That's where I want to be, but I don't know what about the rest of you. If we could just wait a week, talk to people, um, get some information out there. I don't know how you feel about that, or if you want to vote tonight, somebody can throw a motion on the floor. I'm content to wait. I'm in favor of change as, as okay. opposed. I don't but mind. I, I, 
maybe if people feel something. Okay. So how long would it take you guys to actually get all that in motion? Would you be leaving you short at all to get everything out to the people? That's one. Right. Yeah. That's I one mean, we about. would craft a letter. We would define what the programming is, and we already know who the students are. And half of our students are going to kindergarten, so you're talking about you know 47 or 48 students. We would be sending out letters to. So, so we know already know who those students are that are in our program currently. Mm -hmm. Would one week make a difference? No, I no. But it's not just the students in the program too. Right. Many siblings, so siblings is uh, other right. families right. that are interested. Person right. out there know what's going on, right? And so that's my that's my that's my fear yeah. is not reproducing what happened last year. And the longer we wait on this, um, the, the the closer we're getting to holidays and the craziness, and even the chance that something's overlooked um, inadvertently by people uh, during the mm -hmm. craziness, and then boom, we suddenly find out. And I wouldn't be happy at all if you know I have something in my mind and then. <laughs> so why don't we? I, um, move, I move that we approve the change in the pro in the pre-K program as, as specified this year. I second. Okay. Anybody have comments? I do. <laughs> I would prefer to wait, so I'm going to withdraw from this vote. N not that I don't like it. I just want a chance to. Here. When I think She's going to beat me up. No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I, I guess that what I'm thinking about, and this is not going to sound awful, but I don't mean it in this way. It's just sort of a, I, I just heard it said. So we we really like this. We think it's in the best interest. We have the recommendation of our principals and the director of special education and the superintendent, and it makes sense. And if, if we have, uh, people have an opportunity to come to critique it in an, in an attempt to to change the proposal or anything. I don't want to hold out false hope and maybe uh, uh, to people that they're going to change my mind about this. Or that, and I, I get it. I get it. It's a change. It's more convenient to have your kid go to preschool, where you live, all that stuff. I, I, I get that. But this is educationally sound. It supports the intention of having the an integrated preschool. Um, so that's my concern in um, having people come and, 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 and make comments. Whether well, you vote on it tonight or not, if people are, are concerned, well, they're, they're going to know anyway. They're, so, they're but that's, share that. that's my thing. I would hate, like, this isn't, if somebody comes and says um, whatever, unless they say, this is great, good job, um, <coughs> so that's my only thing. I don't want to hold out for us hope because I'm not trying to change my mind. Well, that's you. There's seven others of us. But I'm not going to go ahead, Susan. Um, I don't think that uh, Superintendent Clenchy has made any secret, and and obviously you've been here before too about the fact that there's been they were making attempts to change the programming that they wanted mm -hmm. to streamline things. Mm -hmm. It was on the agenda tonight. It's been it's been on past agendas. So um, you know, I, I'm not saying. I mean, I, I understand that um, we, we, want, we don't want to repeat the same problems that we had last year. We want to hear from the community members. I don't know that they need a personal invitation to come next week, given the fact that you've, you've made it very clear throughout the fall that, mm -hmm. and, and even last year, that this was a priority for the administration. So I, 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 I'm with you're with Kathy. Kathy. I mean, I, I could go both ways, but I, I don't think I'll change my mind about my decision. Oh, I'm not going to change yeah. my mind. I just want to give people, well, maybe I will. Go ahead, Neil. <laughs> so uh, uh, two, two quick things here. So uh, I think spot on. Um, in June of last year, um, there were multiple conversations about the fact that we would love to have you take a look at what to do with the program to align things mm -hmm. and to make it what it was. Mm -hmm. So this is bringing that forward mm -hmm. um, in my mind. This continuation of that conversation that's been happening, it's not something new right. um, that's just sprouted up. Now, in addition to that, um, it's very clearly defined, much more than it was last year in my mind or whatever. This is directed towards the special needs student. This is what it does. Mm -hmm. I, frankly, I, you know, we need to have a different conversation about are we going to have a pre-K program mm -hmm. 
not an integrated pre-K program if, if there's a ton of other people that want to be involved. But this thing itself, I think, is dedicated to the special needs students. And, and that's why I'm okay with voting on that now because it, tomorrow th there could be a thousand people that show up and say, hey, I wanted to change. But that's not helping the student, which is what this that's whole true. thing is for. I got it. Okay? So that's, that's where I'm coming on I that. I got it. Yeah. You're right. Thank you. I think this is much more closely aligned to the mission of the program, mm -hmm. which, as Neil and, and Susan have said, you know, is to serve students with special needs. Mm -hmm. And okay. this makes it very clear. Okay. It's a, a legal obligation, but also an ethical one to be serving these students and you know, the way that we intend to be serving them. Mm -hmm. So the motion's on the table. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you for all of your work. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. So Thank you. But then I want to I want to come back to what Neil said at some point. But yes, communication will be very important. Not just communication. <laughs> okay, moving on to the next subject. I want to oh, yeah. Superintendent Punchy has an announcement. So uh, just for our, our folks that are at home uh, right now, um, I know that uh, the Chairman Romasco just received a text saying, oh my goodness, there are police at the high school. And uh, we, knew, uh, we knew this in advance, okay? So I'm going to read you what the police sent to me earlier. Just wanted you to know that our police academy will be setting up a landing zone on the back of the baseball field tonight. The MSP Airwin will be landing around 7 p.m. and taking off around 8. I think that we thought because this was happening in the dark that like no one would notice, well, clearly we were wrong. <laughs> I spoke with Paul and Tanya. Everybody's aware in case there are any questions coming in regarding the helicopter. Please let me know. See you on Saturday for football. So, <laughs> so please relax if you're hearing about sirens and such over and seeing lights at the high school. It's all good. Okay. Technology update. Technology. Hello. Come on you guys up. waited so patiently. I'm sorry we're running a little bit late. Great discussion with the We have really though. quiet people on the Pat, school Pat, today. Pat. Nobody's got an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll pull Pat close too. So I'll I'll just quickly tee uh, tee it up and uh, kind of let you know who's speaking tonight. Uh, Pat, as always, will be available in case you, you wanted to go back and do a little bit of research here with regards to any fiscal component. Um, you know, uh, Su Suchi, of course, is on my, my left, and uh, Cindy Larson is on my right. Now, the roles are very, very different for all these people, but they all work together. And you see Martina Kenyon is, is back behind because she's also teaching and learning, and she's here to support uh, Cindy and, and she as well. So you've got that whole teaching and learning piece. Cindy really has a focus towards the teaching and learning component of technology and the integration of it into classrooms. So she's really the, the academic, that educational piece of it. Suchi, on the other hand, his role is to make sure that whatever the needs are over here are met. So he's more the hardware, software kind of person. He's the one that helps to establish the vision of what we need, what we have to have. Uh, all together, they worked. They are a key, and, and just to let you know, um, to, our, to my staff, I did mention this when we went through MCAS. You are a key reason why our MCAS scores are the way that they are. You just did such a great job this last year, and I know that you're going to replicate things as we move forward this year. Uh, so these are the key people that were involved in that as well. So I think you're going to talk, uh, and as Cindy said, I'm going to have to talk so fast tonight. And I said yes, because we want you inside that 10 minutes. So well, I want you to well, know that. <laughs> no, I appreciate I mean, the thing is, when you pre give us presentations, it's understood that we're reviewing them. So we don't need you to take us through them. Right. Plus, this is such a big topic that I want to preserve the time for the school committee to ask questions. Great. So with that, Cindy, okay. I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Do you need me to elaborate any more on what I, my function is? No. no, I don't okay. think so. <laughs> okay. All right, great. So uh, before we begin, I want to take the opportunity to thank all those who helped develop the 2016-2018 technology plan and articulate the uh, goals for that plan and the vision. The progress made on those goals for the current plan is in your green packet. Do I see green packet there? Oh, uh, I think there she is. just got them there. She's <laughs> going to distribute them to you. Okay. Um, and uh, this document is entitled Educational Technology Update. This document was sent out to the district last week to keep everyone informed and it is posted on the website as well. If there are questions regarding the progress on these goals, we have slides at the end of the presentation that we can pull up so that we can address them. Um, at this time, we would like to begin to describe the planning processes that are now in place 
and some insight on goals that are being proposed as we move forward to updating the existing plan. And when I say updating the existing plan, I mean we would like to see a 2018 to 2021 plan. Oops, forgot I have this in my hand. <laughs> so planning for educational technology is driven by three different factors. It's important that our students are at the center of our decision-making processes, and therefore, when planning for technology at Neshoba, we begin by asking a few driving questions that help to begin our roadmap. First one is curriculum. Does the program or device align with or support Neshoba curriculum? Second one is learning needs of all students. Does it increase accessibility to educational resources for all students? And the third one is we always want to keep the district improvement plan in mind because it aligns with the district improvement plan. Equally as important is that we vet for several um, areas that <coughs> new programs or devices might impact. First one is security. How does t the proposed technology impact the security of Neshoba's infrastructure and our data? Second one is safety. Are there safeguards in place that protect the privacy of students and the staff? Is it scalable? So do we have the human uh, resources, hardware, and funding resources to support it? Can we expand it so that it becomes sustainable and equitable across the district? And then lastly, interoperability. It is, um, is it compatible with our existing systems and does it promote a seamless flow of, of uh, information? So these drivers I'll be referring back to um, and the vetting considerations as I introduce you to the proposed goals that are coming up. But in order to plan effectively uh, for technology at Neshoba, we really need to enable all stakeholders an avenue to provide feedback and address all areas, the planning process has been restructured to a broader, more collaborative, and inclusive model. So the 2017-18 Technology Committee is made up of administrators from each of the school buildings and two school committee members. So Elise and Neil, in this <laughs> little diagram here, you're right in the center of the Educational Technology Committee. And I'll describe the focus groups around that. I'd like to add that our principals and our assistant principals who are a big part of the committee uh, bring to the table important details of how technology is being utilized in their buildings in a variety of instructional settings and they're excellent advocates when representing the needs of their staff and their students. So at the same time they um, bring to the table a really broad district perspective. So um, while this committee meets every other month, focus groups meet during or after school for the purpose of targeting key technology areas around the goals. So they meet more often throughout the year. And I, I won't have to go in, it, they're up there, I don't want to go into every single one of them, but it's in the interest of time. But each of these groups has a tech committee representative, and this creates a direct path of input into the planning and decision making processes. So educators who are not participating in one of these focus groups are encouraged to go to their school administrators, go to their instructional technology specialists, come to teaching and learning, participate in any small group technology building meetings, and participate in surveys so that they have a voice in what their needs are around technology. The Educational Technology Committee will take into consideration feedback from all stakeholders when planning for technology, and we're going to make sure that it's sustainable and they're safe and that it positively impacts student achievement. So can I stop you right there for yep. a second? So are you guys, I would like to hear more about what you're doing instead That's of how you're structured. Well, this is part of it because these focus groups are meeting now. That's what's happening now. And I, if you want me to, to go over the focus groups, I will, but they're also in the proposed goals. I don't know, what do you got? I want to know what it is we're doing. Yeah, but I think you'll see that. So I, I, I think, okay, yeah, just, I, okay. I would just keep going, City, if you can, but just so okay. you know what okay. you're looking for. All right, so these groups um, do provide a continuous flow of information 
They're, um, they collaboratively problem solve, they collectively make decisions, and they stay connected um, on a weekly, if not daily basis. Um, the, an educational technology update, like the one you have in your packet, will be sent out um, every other month so that all stakeholders are kept informed about updates around technology and what's being promote, proposed or finalized. So we had our first technology committee meeting on November 1st. And at that meeting, uh, Suchi and I proposed um, five goals that we would look at to move on into the future. So the first goal would be to develop a sustainable hardware replacement plan that includes one-to-one -one mobile devices for grades uh, six through 12. In the existing plan right now, this is actually two separate goals. So we have a hardware replacement plan goal, but also a separate goal for expanding one-to-one. -one. We see that as, we would like to see the one-to-one -one as part of the hardware replacement plan overall and combine those two. So um, also new in this is that we are proposing to expand the one-to-one -one model to grades six through 12 in the fall of 2018, where grades six and seven students have access to a one-to-one -one model during the day only, and they leave them in school. So driving factors for this, uh, so some drivers were that Chromebooks really have proven to be effective in helping students have access to the curriculum. And grades six and seven teachers right now are asking for increased availability of Chromebooks as they utilize more authentic and up-to-date curriculum online resources. And at the request of teachers, library media um, staff are actually downsizing their um, text uh, materials on the shelves that are nonfiction because teachers are asking for more online up-to-date resources. And lastly, Chromebooks, um, an increasing Chromebooks would allow teachers to expose students to the next generation assessments that they need that practice in. So the betting considerations, of course, are scalability and an up-to-date comprehensive inventory makes it possible for us to reasonably plan for the replacement of devices and project costs based on age and functionality. And currently, calculations of replacement costs indicate that the cost of expanding to this one-to-one -one model, to this one-to-one -one model, is relatively the same as continuing the replacement of outdated devices. Great. Uh, goal two, the development of a cybersecurity plan and student data privacy protocols in delivery of professional development for educators. So this is a concern for all industries right now, as you probably know, and there's a growing K through 12 state initiative as well um, that we have joined. It's called the Massachusetts Student Privacy Alliance. Um, Suchi and I have been to a couple of workshops on cybersecurity. I'm going to an all day one tomorrow in Connecticut um, that they help you plan out how you're going to protect your data and how you protect your students. So uh, obviously the main driver is protection of student and staff privacy and protection of all of our data. And uh, we need to, you know, vet out, you know, the availability of expert resources in this area. And we need to look at how we're going to provide professional development to staff because we do need to educate the end user because that helps keep us safe with good practices as well. <coughs> And then we want to look at um, cost and effectiveness of programs that will help us to provide extra security. So one of the things that so I, the IT or Suchi had put into the uh, budget last year was a program called CloudLock that provides um, security and protects users and online data and applications. And Suchi, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's going to be ready to probably go online. Yes, actually it's in place already. Yeah. So um, we'll be looking at that. And then um, IT is also currently researching new content filters for next year that will provide more uh, granular control. So um, <coughs> planning of educational technology filters, uh, working towards interoperability. So working towards interoperability within our systems is a goal that will be continued from the current plan, so that's already on there. Um, the main drivers for that are the need to provide streamlined and timely access to data that's organized in a manner that supports informed decision making. Um, 
It's also aligned with our district improvement goal number one, teaching all students. Um, <coughs> we need to vet the cost effectiveness, uh, cost effectiveness of this. Um, so kind of, um, we need to move to a more holistic system. So a holistic, the cost of a holistic system that incorporates a lot of different systems that we're using now that are all separated it makes it very difficult for staff to get data all in like a one-stop shop and get all data that they need for students in one place. So we have developed the, um, I started a integrating systems focus group this year and we've met several times already. And we've already had two demonstrations from major vendors um, looking at how we can integrate our information systems with a learning management system that is um, actually one of the things that I would like to see is that it's completely seamless with Google Apps as well. So it keeps everything in one place. Um, <coughs> so number four, um, teaching and learning. Um, obviously we'll, thank you Alita. <laughs> you can tell my mouth is dry. <laughs> um, so curriculum and learning needs um, of all the students are obviously a driver for this goal. And we'll continue with providing professional development for effective practice of, of technology and one-to-one. -one. Uh, we did that last year and the year before and they were well attended. Um, but we also knew this year as we're developing, a, in con a working with uh, Joan, uh, director of PBS, to develop a digital program evaluator team. And so we're doing, be conducting interviews next week for this. We've had several people apply to be on this team. Um, this team will actually vet all the technology programs that are coming in every day in front of educators. And it's a monstrous task. So we need to make sure that we're using all those drivers and those vetting <coughs> considerations when we look at new programs. And then another consideration that's new is the um, new digital learning computer science frameworks um, from Massachusetts. And uh, the biggest change in, the, in these um, frameworks are that they see students as creators of technology and not just end users. So it means more computer science type things. <coughs> so the vetting considerations for that are the resources on professional development, protection of student privacy, um, and obviously scalability and uh, future purchases that support new standards. The last goal is to improve um, the NRSD websites. And that's driven by the need to have an um, accessibility, accessibly compliant website and ease of access to current information to, for all of our end users. And our vetting considerations for that are human resources and time on task and additional costs for tools that span for accessibility. So I hope this, I mean, I could tell you more that's happening, but these are some of the groups that are happening now and actively been working since school started. Um, if there are any questions, I guess we're open for questions now. <laughs> You don't have any questions? Not at this point, not yet. Okay, Lynn. Um, is there a plan to keep all of this technology sustainable? Yes. So any particular subject like uh, area you want to know, like networking, hardware? All of it. Um, we have a pretty clear inventory. Um, as mentioned in this plan, uh, we have al also like uh, there's a fixed, almost fixed like um, replacement cycle, like laptop you know, every five years, Chromebook every four years, iPad, so on and so forth. So we do have that in plan. For the software, um, software license is renewed on a yearly basis. Um, I think that also is planned uh, um, according to what the teacher learning need. So in Lynn, some of that is found in this education technology update. So that would be information on the update for um, goal number four. But the, the budget for this is gross, continually. And I'm just wondering, that's really where I'm going with that. 
the the budgeting actually it doesn't grow too much. Like software, all the software we use, um, they have annual like five to ten percent increase. That's almost cross board on every software we use. And this year we increase, uh, we add like a couple more software, couple new software. So that that's why you see a little bit more increase for the hardware. Uh, I'm not sure if like uh, you see the, the like the first drop of hardware. The increase really is not much. So so what you see is. Because last year the, the number you see is we take the e rate rebate off already. But if you put that back in, it's really not much difference. Okay. Um, so what I would personally love to be able to see um, is how. So there's two sections to the presentation here, um, and I would love to see how one does it dovetails into the other. And, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, I jumped ahead, so that's why I didn't want to ask a question to begin with, because it, it, it dovetails together. Um, but what is that? really, how does this, how does this all focus on the students? I don't see a lot of student-driven information that's here, and that's, that's what I'm seeing. That, that's all I'm saying, is like, I'm not seeing how uh, our big initiative for one-to-one, -one. like wh what is that actually doing? And that's a really, that's a big driver for technology. Mm -hmm. um, so how is that working in the, in the classrooms? And I know that that's, that's the part you're playing too, but, um, but how is that working in the classrooms? What, like what is coming about from this? What, how are we, how are we even justifying having a one-to-one -one program? Um, and I guess what I mean by that is, is, I mean, I know some of the answers, you know, the collaboration and so forth and things that get brought forward. Um, and I'd just love to be able to, to see that, maybe at a later point or something like that, but I'd, I'd love to be able to see how what we're, what we're spending money on is dovetailing in and in, in, in genuinely affecting the children and in, 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 in what, what that educational. Am I rambling or just not? No, I mean, we, we have surveys um, that we survey the students and the parents and the staff mm -hmm. on the use of one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. So we could definitely, you know, give you those results. I know I have um, some results up on the one-to-one -one Chromebook site. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have more results that I gathered from last spring. And mm -hmm. we'll, we're going to redo that in the spring. Um, we're going to actually, um, I'm working very closely with um, Beth Pratt, the new assistant principal of academics at the high school in Mary Marotta, the instructional technology specialist. <coughs> we're right now um, forming, um, we want to do, we surveyed the staff at the high school because it wasn't a well turnout mm -hmm. staff response last year. So we're going to um, do that in January and then we'll do the students again in April. But it, every question on the survey asks how it impacts their ability mm -hmm. to deeper learning or flexible learning or personalized learning, how it you know, asks detailed questions about how they're using it. I'd be glad to share that with you. And, and thank you. And, and so, uh, but I think, so my, my daughter is, um, my younger daughter is now getting involved in this. Again, my, my older daughter was riding the first wave of this. So. Yeah. So, um, so what I I know some of the things and some of the benefits, and I'd like to see that brought forward so the community can also share with that too. Because I see uh, my daughter come in with, uh, it, it, she still carries unfortunately a huge knapsack, and there was a conversation I think on Facebook about textbooks and all this, which I won't. But I'd like to see um, the community being able to view how how homework is done. The collaboration that's involved. I know there's even um, the, it's just a group of friends that's a study group, and they, they video yeah. chat. So they, they whatever it is, uh, you know, Skype or whatever they're doing, mm -hmm. uh, whatever app they're using. But they're they're communicating together, and someone's stuck on something. They're helping them out. They're like, hey, check this out. Look here or there. They're studying together, mm -hmm. and you know, you're using Google Classroom. You're able to put things forward to the. So I think even a presentation on that, where how that works with the interaction between the teaching, uh, the teachers, me as a parent being able to go on and you know they, they may say you know I my doc, can you help me edit this right when you're putting something and and how how that all that's what I'd like to see so personally. Two years ago we did that in the first year so. When we first started the one-to-one, right. one, mm -hmm. we did that. We had like four educators come in with students. Mm -hmm. We could do that again. 
I, I, it's just me personally, but I just think this is yeah. a presentation yeah. that kind of goes out not just to the school community, but goes to the community too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, it's true. It's true. Oh, yeah. And and I'm not. I'm not yeah. All right. I'm not okay. pooing on your gonna, presentation here. Does anybody else here. have anything they want to add? Thank you, Neil. If I can, I just add one point. For this one tour, um, starting next year, all grade level six, uh, three to twelve, um, we have to do the online testing. So right. with this one to one, this this is a great help for the student get familiar with the device and practice <coughs> all these online skills. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. All of it is is a Monday Monday very you know direction. Okay. So. But they're not taking them home, right? The sixth graders aren't, or they are taking them. Sixth and seventh grade, the principals felt more comfortable with them just staying in the school building. So, so this document, um, I haven't had a chance to read this because we just got it handed to us, but there's a lot of... Look, I gave it to you in June. And it's just and a refresher. This, this yeah, is two this years ago. June. Yeah, yeah and um, I okay. Dr. Bates so presented it as well. With all due respect, five months, a lot of life happens. <laughs> it would have been helpful for us to get this early because I think this would have been able to answer some of the questions I had in the middle of the presentation. Sure, and, 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 and there, uh, we can certainly bring folks back or if you want to take a look at, at a different type of presentation like you're describing, mm -hmm. you know, that's completely different than, than this type well, of presentation. That's demonstration. Yeah. What yeah. Neil's looking for is a demonstration. What I was looking for was this. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate getting this. Now I'm going to go back and read it again. And then this is the update. Yeah, right. The update is really important to read. Okay. And then really, Lorraine, what I want you to know is the process for, around decision making is a lot more inclusive than it has been in the past. And I think that's really important that we listen to all of our stakeholders. Yeah, because that really wasn't the way it was. And so, right. You know, I have a. We have a very good group that will meet four times during the year, but also has a pulse. Every administrative meeting that we have, technology is on the agenda every single time. Every single time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every single time. Uh, in the principal's meeting, sometimes Suchi and I are called in the principal's yeah. meeting. It must happen every other week. But um, I just want ed our educators, our staff, to know that there's avenues to provide feedback, and we're listening. And I wanted to do, do we that. have people in, and I know this is, I appreciate that, and I know what I'm going to ask is going to sound like kind of junior to what you're talking about. Do we have people in each of the buildings now dedicated to those buildings, sitting in those buildings to help the staff? Well, you have yes, the IT. We do. Yeah. Yes. We do. Yes. Okay. The ITS people are there. Mm -hmm. Like they are and physically. physically the, yes. Not, okay. Because like I knew yeah. they were like upstairs at one point, but they weren't in the building. Totally, di and totally oh, different. Uh, it just depends uh, on what you're asking for. Right. But so we have uh, ITS people totally dedicated in every building. So ITS is an instructional technology specialist who is a teacher. And IT um, works under Sue Chi's team, and that they do fix it. But we have an instructional technology specialist in every building, and the middle schools are now fully staffed with that, and it's made a huge difference for teachers. Right. And it's important in those middle schools. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to point out, too, and I appreciate you bringing up about communication, you too communicate. Like, you meet every right. Monday morning. Right. Very and often the three of us meet. So a lot of what we're doing is in right here. Yeah. So, I mean, there is a huge amount of ongoing communication. Pat's, uh, well, the reason Pat's in the middle there is because she's very often meeting with them. Yeah, in the middle. You're always in the middle. We're <laughs> <laughs> well, teaching and learning. I mean, there's just a lot of collaboration here. I mean, Joan's very active with, uh, with it all. So, I mean, we're all very actively involved in this. So all I right. appreciate that message. All right. Any other questions for the group? Mark, sure. I just called you Neil. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> Sorry, Neil. Call me Bert. Bert? <laughs> we like Bert and Bolton. He's a good guy. <laughs> the, um, the current um, people or grades that are in possession of one to one computers right now or this year? Eight, nine, and ten. Eight, nine, and ten. And so next year we're going down two grades? Or two, down two grades and up two grades. So it'll be one to one, hopefully, six I through see. twelve. And that really helps us as you know with the next generation assessments. Um, so we're actually taking a kind of a big bite in terms yeah. of equipment purchase in the coming fiscal year, right? That's one of the requests uh, yeah. that we should anticipate. Is that actually, correct? well, the so card model is sorry. That's the okay. card model is uh, we buy one to one for eighth grade only. Then they go from eighth to ninth to ten. Then we also have card and classroom based Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. 
So the new model we propose is we buy sixth grade and eighth grade. Then we stop upgrading the classroom and car based old equipment. Mm -hmm. But the current old equipment, not oh, I shouldn't say old, the current car and classroom based Chromebooks, we have enough, and they are pretty decent um, age wise, only one or two years old. We have enough to give to seventh and twelfth grade. So if we go this, this model with sixth and eighth, next year instantly, from all our middle school and high school, we become truly one to one. And the, the cost, you wouldn't see much difference. Like uh, I did a rough like calculation. Currently, the, all the cards and classroom based machine, the so Chromebooks, we have 250 Chromebooks. The so current fifth grade student, we have 270, 272. So there are only about like 20 difference. Mm -hmm. So if we stop upgrading the classroom and card based, we can use all those mm -hmm. machines, you know. So it's really about a redistribution yes. of, of the hardware. Yeah. It's like one grade level addition. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and uh, as uh, Cindy had said earlier, and, and Chi as well, you know, that MCAS mm -hmm. mandate mm -hmm. has really <laughs> helped us to rethink things. I had a question about that, because I thought that last year, if, if a district couldn't prove that they had the capability to, um, what, what was it that got in the way of everybody taking it last year? Well, so are you thinking just that if, oh, no, it, it's just what, what, the, what the state said. The state the was state the one who mandated the year. Right, sure. right but, but I thought you had to prove that you either didn't have the technology available. Was it the number of? You could ask for a waiver. You could ask for a waiver, but that. chose we not to. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So the district which I teach, we everybody was online mm -hmm. because it's a brand new building, brand new, brand new. Um, you know, we had access to enough technology. Mm -hmm. What? Why? Why didn't that happen at Nashua? Was it? Wasn't it the the Wi-Fi wasn't up? What, uh, what did you think didn't happen at Nashua? It's the expansion and of the. It, it no, you, not every grade level took it online. Expansion of the Right, but we uh, we didn't. We didn't have to. It wasn't mandated. We, oh, we I thought I thought you had to prove in order for no, no. We didn't okay, so what was mandated. We right. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. I thought you had. Okay. And so we literally and we saw this coming. So we've literally been thoughtful and phased it in with MCAS. Okay. Right. Okay. And the, the mandate for this year is the addition of grade five and grade seven. Yep. And then the following year, spring of nineteen, it'll be grade three and grade ten. Yeah. Okay. So that does lead me to the next question that I have. So I know in the past we've we've been sort of keeping up with uh, bandwidth and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean that you're going to have the infrastructure in place or it's in yeah, place already so to be able to deal with mm -hmm. that? Because that's a big, right. big and jump. That's, it, okay. that's in here too. Okay. So we've been updating the switches using the category two to get refunded at the 50% back mm -hmm. rate. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, in but 100% of our classrooms have its own wireless access point. Okay. Not every area in the building, but every classroom does. And all the switches, that, uh, the switches that need to be upgraded were upgraded, and we will do it again next summer. Right, so two things on that. So are we uh, throttling down based on usage like we were? Or are yes, we, are we Okay, so that's been a huge problem for some people at the high school when they're doing like video content and so forth, um, and kids having to go to their, their their cell phones. I mean, we've gone through this. You're talking about this year? I'm talking in the past. Oh, that, right. That's happened, okay. and that's that's okay. so. Okay. And, and so there was there was talk about how to how to work around that, so we had the bandwidth to be able to to not have kids, you know, have to throttle down um, because then that becomes a paperweight at that right. point. Thanks. Um, so. Are we still throttling down, or are we? Yes, we do. Okay. So no, for that one, I think um, I really appreciate you bringing this up. But I, I also yeah. I really like to get directly involved. Yeah. Whoever report this to you, yeah. I like to see the scenario when that happened yeah. because the way we manage shouldn't have any that kind of impact at all. Mm -hmm. I showed you last time, uh, last last year when we discussed the bandwidth we get per mm -hmm. student, actually per student per teacher. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't have that kind of issue at all. And also, we separate the personal device and also the school -owned device. There's always an issue like when they can't play slow, are they slow on their personal device? Are they slow on their school -owned device? Right, so do you guys do trouble tickets to figure I'm that out? I'm going to interrupt like you for a second. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This sounds like a conversation that you guys should be having. Because I don't know if the rest of us are gathering this information up or if it's a separate conversation. Yes, I, absolutely. Any time, like if you guys have this kind of, kind of you know, I can go, you know, have a separate one. So, what venue? Should we bring this down to 
BMW and have the car, you know what I mean, or, or here? Well, I guess, what is it that you want to know, because... I, well, there's a lot to this. Um, well, okay. You know, I mean, that's that's one of the questions that I had with, you know, with the addition of additional grades and so forth, it's going to be using more bandwidth and so forth, and if we have to throttle down based on usage, I'm and, and, and I'm not in the industry, but it's just, you know, want to make sure that the kids have the capabilities. And then my other question was on the, uh, the, the filter that you're looking for. Um, is that going to be variable so that the high school is not being filtered at the same level that, let's say, the kids in sixth grade are? Right. Well, we do that now. Okay. That, that's yeah. all. I, I knew, knew mm -hmm. stuff, so thank you. That's all the stuff I'm trying so to do. So how many, yeah. how many, so you guys have met, I mean, this is, I think, one of the problems. You guys have met with? Nope. I have not. I've waited for this to come out before. So when is your technology yes, meeting that they're invited to? It was November 1st. Yeah, November 1st. Yeah, so on November 1st, I was sick, so I was not there that day. Yeah, at least let me know she was ill. So do you meet regularly? So the technology committee is going to meet every other month this year because all those other things are happening in between and all of those things that are happening are going to be driven into that technology committee with the um, and as I said it's made up of um, school building administrators uh, Joan D'Angelo so she's still behind she's still here. <laughs> Sonnet teaching learning Sonnet so all that information filters up and where we can really because I, I, I think what's I think what's happening is you have your plan that you want us to understand and see which we appreciate you putting that together but I think what Neil's getting at are some of the concerns that have happened in the past and we probably need to get some answers on those because we do get questions we get emails about mm -hmm. them Lynn's nodding her head yes too so um, we need to figure out how to get that information get those questions cataloged in order to get give you folks a chance to answer those questions but I also want to be able to share that information because I'm a conduit to the community and I don't necessarily understand this so mm -hmm. um, I don't think it would be B&W but I I don't think there's I, I, but I don't think there's a, no I'm just saying I'm trying to figure out in my head right so the but with technology it, we're we're there and and I know that there's there's been a request earlier in the year for us not to necessarily be so involved. These are the professionals that are handling this and so forth. We're more observation kind of going into this. So if you have questions right. that you mm -hmm. want answers to, mm -hmm. then detail those questions out. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and I'm going to open this up to everyone because we might as well get a comprehensive list of questions. And then we're going to funnel it to you. But I'm going to ask that those questions be thoroughly answered because then it's going to come back to everyone. You'll certainly probably take the lead on to you, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. And then if there needs to be a follow-up conversation, then we'll do it. Or if there's a pressing need that needs a follow-up conversation, mm -hmm. then we'll do that because um, this this is a big ticket item in the district budget, and it's bigger than that. It's an enabler to a different way of learning, and I think that's probably the concern that we're we're all, we're all not really getting it. Probably that's why you mentioned earlier. I need to see a demonstration. I need to understand how this happens. Is that am I? It's kind of like how how the the, the back room dovetails with the front room, if you know what I'm saying. So what forward facing the kids, the teachers dovetails with what you guys are doing. That's really one of, I, I want to see how that's that's being brought together as more of a seamless thing and, and how it's actually enhancing our educational model here in the district mm -hmm. rather than just being mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know so another thing in the NAPS Act. Yeah. And that and that that's really the that's where I'm coming from on this. But there are that I but I think everybody else here would like to hear that, right? So I don't know how to structure that, so I'm just going to take that to you and yeah, you guys I, are going to figure out how you're going to get it to us. I, I was just thinking, you know what, I think what we'll do is we can go back and have some further discussion amongst 
all of us mm -hmm. and and come up with some ideas in the meantime though i think the questions i think you should follow the questions through and, yeah. and, and maybe and i apologize i'm not trying to i'm not, I'm not trying to that's not the, that's not the issue I, neil i think that maybe if it it may need we may need to ask them to come back in um in order for us to understand chunks of this and come back and present Well, we got to figure. Yeah, I don't. I mean, it's fine. I, I'm, I'm amenable to anything. Can I say something? Yeah. I think uh, Neil, like, just be frank. You know, I'm speaking here. Yeah. <laughs> Since I know him for like almost two, three years, mm -hmm. I feel there's some kind of miscommunication. Or like, a, mm -hmm. I every time I see you, like, mm -hmm. I feel there's some kind of frustration. Mm -hmm. from your side. Absolutely. Yes. And same that as me. That would be incorrect. One thing we are doing now is mm -hmm. we bring this like this new group. Like uh, this, we meet like four times a year. Mm -hmm. We try to establish a stream, a streamlined communication. Mm -hmm. Like, what we hope is, what I want to say is, I don't want always get like you know when you come here, you feel so much question unanswered. Mm -hmm. But on my side, from me, I never heard that kind of question. Mm -hmm. I feel like in kind of question like all this like you know, people have issue about their streaming, and uh, network doesn't working. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop We've this. This, 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 isn't, this is not, this is not appropriate for yeah. right now. Right. I think that discussion needs to be taken offline, and I'm gonna ask yeah. you to broker a discussion because I think Neil's got some concerns, mm -hmm. and Suchi's probably got some concerns, and yeah. I'd ask Neil to come back and report to us on what you learned. I would love to. How does that work? Yeah, I'm good with that. Okay. Oh. I, I'm not trying. To, I, I try actually. What I no, I understand. But I, but honestly, this we've yeah. got we've got a full agenda and we're behind. And I think that that way, if you guys can get it to get, figure out what it is that needs to be articulated, and then bring it back in, that makes more sense. Yeah, <coughs> I agree. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Well, I thank you so it. much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So now we're moving to old business. Um, and OPEB. Um, so, gosh, my gosh, when was it? We had um, two vendors come in, trusts um, that, that manage OPEB trusts, um, and I asked the Budget and Warrant Subcommittee to um, review the documentation um, and come forward with a, um, a recommendation on what to do with the trust and um, what to do with funding levels for OPEB for this um, cur coming budget cycle, and then any thoughts about moving forward. So Neil, I'm turning it over to you. Sure, so we did meet, we had a conversation, um, and administration had some thoughts um, with what you'd like to bring forward. We agreed um, on the thoughts, and um, <laughs> So essentially it was, um, at, at this point in time, uh, we're looking at shooting for a target for this year in the budget of $100,000. Um, increase. Increase, right. Increase from the 50,000? So 150,000 total? So it it no, from 50,000 to 100,000. Mm -hmm. we, we had 50,000 in the budget last year. Mm -hmm. We're saying we would go oh, to okay. 100,000 potentially <coughs> this year. Right, the, last the year we shot for 150. Last year we shot for 150. When we ended up coming back to 50. Right. Oh, Didn't make that. We're trying to get the we're trying to get the uh, the hundred thousand dollars in there, but we need to come up with a plan about to take this forward and increase this uh, year over year. Um, we don't have recommendations for company to work with. I think there's still more uh, mm -hmm. conversation that needs to happen from that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, this is a big this is a big nut. I mean, we need to take care of it. We need to do this. Um, we started with with that for recommendation. Um, I think that uh, another thing. I mean, we didn't talk about it, but I'll throw it out there tonight because we need to do that, and that is um, set up a uh, an irrevocable trust for that money that we have right now. Um, and it's this, my understanding is the school committee needs to direct the administration to, to set up the irrevocable trust. Uh, I don't know if that's something that we want to. So so okay so. Not. So we've got three things now. We've got we've got the trust, right. and then if and and frankly, I'm hoping you guys are going to say we need to set up trust. Um, and if not, why not? So I think you're gonna. I think maybe what needs to happen is to have a point of view on that. If you want to 
dinner there was another vendor that you might be calling and then take those three vendors and evaluate trust or no trust if as trust do you have one of the vendors that you met with that you'd recommend and then so that's one set of discussions right that you would present mm -hmm. right um, and then Steve you all set yes um, okay have a seat and then if uh, <laughs> and then the next um, discussion point is <sighs> what a night um, the amount that you're recommending to contribute to OPEB for the FY18. The contribution is what we, what we discussed 19. today. Yeah. So you're saying, we, or so we're, this year we made a 50,000, this this current budget, ugh. Yes. That's God, FY18 was 50,000, <coughs> FY19 you're recommending to be 100,000. Okay. And so the administration, uh, they, they went forward and they, they pulled up a lot of regional school district information as far as who's contributing right now to the <coughs> program, um, how they're stepping this up, et cetera, where they are. Um, there's a, uh, the, you know, we talked about this, some of the, the, the more well-to-do uh, districts are putting an incredible amount of money in there um, and they're doing very, very well. Uh, there are some districts which are putting in token amounts of you know ten or fifteen thousand dollars there, and there are many districts not doing anything at this point in time. Uh, so it's still very much um, the wild west out there, mm -hmm. um, and I think we need to get ahead of this and come up with something um, that's that's thoughtful and sustainable, um, and and that's really the key. Um, how can we do something sustainable to reach the goal? Uh, and and that's really I think why we kind of push some of that um, off because that's a big hard conversation to have mm -hmm. um, yeah but I think it's um I, I mean I think it makes sense we, we we were we stuck our toe in the water two years ago and was like okay we're gonna put this 25,000 here because we're really not sure what's going on with our budget anyway and then last year was like well okay we'll do 50 and then now the hundred thousand I mean makes me nervous but it makes me nervous on both ends right it makes me nervous to fund it you know, to, to scrape the money, especially as we're hearing about all these grants that are going away. And I forgot to ask Pat if there was any information on the E grant, the E rate, E rate. If that's if that's solid right now. I haven't heard anything. Okay, but then on the other side, it's like, well, if we don't do anything, we're kind of in a tough spot. Well, we're adding every year uh, to 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 things. Right. And if you look at the actuarial actuarial report. Um, you know, I mean, it's 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 crazy, and and it's you know just under what about a million dollars a year that we're looking at here. So, a um, hundred thousand still way short of covering what we need to be putting in. Right. But can we put in a million dollars a year? You no, know, we, we don't. That's we not can't. Question. I mean, so so, but do you understand what I'm saying? So there's there's there has to be something thoughtful. <coughs> and this needs to be taken care of. But how? Uh, it's not a it's not a simple question unless we're really going to um, either expand the budget or cut into the budget uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> to accommodate that month that money and so that's not like one little thing that just the three of us in in the subcommittee <coughs> come up with in a, in a couple of meetings and for clarification purposes um, I said like last year you're absolutely right he started down the road the hundred fifty thousand was where we started last year and then I obviously had to whittle it down to fifty thousand we just for the for the, for the purposes of a, a, a purpose of a qualifier we're aiming for that hundred thousand I don't know if we can do it or not but that's what we're aiming for so we're well we got to make a commitment I, I mean we don't have to vote on this it comes through in the budget when we go through the budget but so today, Pat brought up a great point. So we have to we have to also be cognizant of um, you know. So we do have bonding issues as far as you know. We need to make sure that we're okay and, and not getting you know dinged on things uh, yeah. for rates. Uh, now that being said, you've got to be giving some sort of according to the person we had in here. We have to be giving some sort of realistic um, money to this that's going to show that we are trying, in fact, to, to solve the issue. On the flip side, uh, if our E and D levels drop down to near nothing, that's going to affect our bond issue too. You know, our bond rating too. So, uh, um, so, th so that's what you there are so many. So there are so many moving parts yeah. to this, and because we're, um, you know, and and I envy the towns that have been able to, to solve this, but they started a while ago, I think, and 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 I mean, we're we're we've got such a knot now that. It, 
help. <laughs> so uh, let's go back to you made the recommendation. You're targeting a hundred thousand for this year, and then you folk that you're going to bring one more um, vendor in. Vendor yeah. in, and then budget and warrant. You'll do you'll do your thing. Look at do you want to recommend a trust because we got to do something with that money, yeah. and then. Um, how, what would that look like? And I think you come forward with the recommendations. So we would, I don't think we're going to recommend the trust. I think we would recommend that the administration set up and go through the process of setting up the trust. Um, the well, other people, the other three people that came in, they don't, they're not the trust, in the, they're the money managers. They're the managers, basically. right. Yeah. PARS actually is a trust. Right, they'll do we'll, the they trust. Are all Let's leave it at thing. this. You guys go off, come back, and recommend to the full school committee what you think we should do. Right. That's what that's what we need to be, where we need to be. All right, let's move on. Well now. Susan, policy. So, yep. So the bylaws, I apologize, were part I we put the entire section A in the packet again. So sorry. But the bylaws were there. And I tried to address all of the concerns that everybody had and ran them by Dorothy and she said that the changes that are here are fine. Um, the thing, so I'll just go through on, on Article 2, the changes I made were Article 2, Section 3. Um, there was some concern, and I know Lynn, you, you mentioned it earlier, there, there was some concern about um, our level of oversight and, and being more specific about what what, what we were, s I think it was you, Lorraine, Lorraine that, that were concerned about um, Like what we what we should take responsibility for in that first article two section three for the business administrator and the assistant <coughs> superintendent and the contracts and all that wasn't that you that that was talking about that so what I all I did was I took the MGL language and put it in there and I didn't know if if any if any of that clarified your concerns and if so we could maybe pull from it and and add it to that. Section? Does that I'm make okay sense? with you leaving the reference in there. My whole question was the May uh, needs to stay. The May and the we can't change the May's and the shalls. No, no, no. I'm oh, not going to touch that. Okay. I wouldn't touch that. Um, my only concern was the we 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 as, as a district ended up in a funky spot because um, an assistant superintendent contract. <coughs> I, I think we expected that we were supposed to have reviewed it. Every new um, contract cycle is the equivalent of a new hiring. Right. And the, the school committee should approve the contract. Mm -hmm. Additionally, the school committee should be made aware of anything in a contract that is, a, is extraordinary and has budget impact. And none of that happened. So, so you're okay with just having the reference there? You don't want to take anything out of that? I don't want to take it out. I want it. I want no, anything out of that quote that would make that more clear. You, I think you could leave okay. that in there because it, it, no one's got to go look it up. Okay, oh, that's why I, I, I think if that's. Right, a, so I think that's helpful for included. people. Okay, so add you guys. That. Yeah. I think so too. Okay, so add so, that in. Again, Wait a second. Is. That's uh, Article Two, Section Three. Right. So you said the may and the shalls have to stay. Yes. So if it, it's a may, it's not a a will. A school committee will award a contract to the superintendent of schools. Because, I, well, yes, okay, I was looking at, at section three, but yeah. Okay. This is, I think this is what I recall us having a disagreement about. The, You're on the section two, right? Section two, uh, section three, I'm looking at. Okay. All right. MGL. The business the article two, one. yes, I know it's MGL, but when we ran into a problem previously is with May, the superintendent awarded the contract to the assistant superintendent without unbeknownst to the um, school. school committee. So when you say that we may award it to a school business administrator, it, when you say may, it, it's not necessarily well, so. But what this section of the article is, 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 try, is, making, is trying to make clear is that, uh, Dorothy explained it, that not every school com not every district, district hires have, a, a business right. minister some may share it with the town <coughs> no, so I, yeah understandably, but understandably. we do but right we do. so so th that all that's saying is that yes we may have one or we may not it's not necessarily 
But the way that I interpret it, it the way you yes. say it makes it clear. Yeah. If you have one, then you Yeah, may. so I can add that. Yeah, sure. Um, if, if the district in, I just don't ever want to see this district in that position. That's again. exactly yeah, that's the point. Yes. Yes. It, if yeah. there is one, then yes, okay. the school okay. committee should. Shall. <laughs> okay, <Okey -dokey, laughs> moving on. So, so would it satisfy would everybody's concerns to add a phrase which makes that clear? I think Susan's in, got it. In the case that there is a contract. I think that was okay. the point. We yeah. still have Thank to keep you. the May, though. Right. We still I, have to, okay. <laughs> so yeah. I'll add one that says yeah. if, we have, if we have one, yeah. right. we shall award a contract. Yes. Right. That's but, good. but they may or may not actually award one. <laughs> Well, it's I the re know. well. I mean, it's <laughs> similar to the business manager. So the superintendent makes the recommendation, but but the yeah. but the, the hire doesn't happen if okay. the school committee uh, doesn't approve. You know, I'm, I'm just a, yeah. a, a thought. I would connect with Dorothy on that and I, explain. I you explain this, but yes. the, the, this yes. understanding. Yep. yep. The other thing. And she thought yeah. that adding this language from MGL would be would be would suffice. Yeah. But I can go back to her, and, and, and she, I'm sure she would have no trouble with us adding. We just can't change what's there. That's well, she's all. aware of the problem, so she'll know it. Yes, no, yeah. right, yep. But the other thing is we do have a policy that wasn't followed previously saying that the school committee sets salary yeah. levels. Yeah. And included in that, it's not just the, the salary, and maybe that's something we could tweak in the policy that, that it's <laughs> you can have lots of policies, but if they're not followed, that well, that's the, it. But not just the, the, the salary, that's, but yeah. the benefits that have a monetary value. You have the a term for it. The compensation package. <laughs> <laughs> you said something. I, well, it's kind but of anyway, that, that, might be, that might be the safety net for this. And the problem was it was never followed. Okay, so you know what you're doing. Well, I, I think I do. I'm adding. I'm adding a shall to. Okay. All right, a shall. Okay. Is there anything else in here, Susan, we need to be made aware of? Yeah. Run quickly. Well, we, I, I mean, I, these are all changes that, that, that um, you guys wanted. So on Article 6, Section 1, um, we can't appoint the business manager as treasurer, so I just crossed all that out and said yeah. to hire a treasurer and then added... Do you see what I added? Mm -hmm. Okay. I did, and I read through all this, and I thought it was there was one... Uh, it Okay, Susan, in that one, Article... Six, section one, one, two, three, four, and it's a nit, but whatever. The fifth line, after committee comment, it is the responsibility. You were in the word is. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Typo. Yeah, no. That's all. Just a little mini thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But that says what you wanted. Yeah, to I think it's good. It. Yeah. And then um, I just I ran it by Alita, um, Article Seven, Section Two. Yep. Yeah. You just prepare uh, correct the correct record and post them. Then I, I didn't know if we needed the safeguarding <coughs> in minutes. I'm, do you want to keep that in C? <coughs> if they're posted online, are they safeguarded? Is that a well, don't we want a paper care? record anyhow and to okay. know that it's well do organized? No, there's no paper. We are keeping we, we're not keeping so paper records keep right now. No, it's online. Yeah. So, so there's no archive? Online. It's, it's an online, online archive. Yeah, online archive. So do we need C? That's gone. Yeah. Yeah. So well, we do have executive session stuff that's never online. So where is that kept? Executive session minutes are approved. But they're not online. No. They're kept electronically. Yeah. Okay. They're not accessible unless somebody wants them. Is that right. your point? Yeah, right. What's th what's the what's well, the my concern is have we all know electronic things are can be troublesome and it's nice to have permanent archive and so I'm just a little concerned about I maybe we've abandoned this for years you now and I haven't known it. You <laughs> should see my home office because I have <coughs> stacks of paper because I'm addicted to it. Yeah. But I but I think we're good with the electronic stuff. So I'm with you and on that personally but I'm sorry. the only other thing was Neil you Article twenty three, section two, you wanted me to strike or said subcommittee <coughs> and I did and that's that. I think I got everybody. Awesome. Okay. Susan, so I can't I believe how much patience you have. No, no. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not a very careful listener. I was going to ask six you six what grade six you taught. Is it seventh grade? Wow. Six 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 for Article 23, Section 2, I will vote down this change because I disagree with it. And it doesn't change the fact that any school committee member can make a public records request. 
So you Article might as well make it through the subcommittee chairs. You know. Article 23. No, Wait, 23. which? Section 2. 23, section 2. Oh, the subcommittee thing. Right. Oh, okay, thing. so we get a little debate. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm yeah. perhaps the lone ranger on this. I think you should let your subcommittees ask for information. If you don't, your individual school committees are going to start, members are going to start asking for information. Hang on, I'm not, I'm not there yet. <laughs> it's, it's slowly <coughs> taking me down these pages. So section 23, article 23, which section are? It's section page 11 of 12, two. section 2. And the last okay. three words of previous. Or a said subcommittee? Right. Um, I thought, so yeah. I mean, we didn't vote last time, but I, or it was October 11th, so, so you it was don't a while back. You don't want to tell the chair that you're looking for information? My, so, 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 so my point of view, which I announced previously, is that you should let the subcommittees ask for stuff. That's all. All right, I'm lost here. And, uh, it was, it nice was about going through the chair yeah. uh, yeah. to get to the superintendent that's and right. the staff. Yeah, that's right. And, and so we, yes. I thought we had decided all together <coughs> whether or not we, had, well, there was no dissent, I guess. Um, on that, on in October. Oh, yeah, honey, I'll that, fight you on that yeah, one. Yeah. We'll cancel each other out. Yeah, <laughs> I'm good so, with that. I'm just, right. I'm just saying that's it's where okay. I stand on that. I think that that our, so our that <coughs> protocol. It's part of our yeah, protocol. Yeah. Yeah. It's in right. the bylaws. Yes. Yeah. This, well, this, this, this is what people asking. For well, this is what's that. created exactly. the problems in the past. Exactly. All right. So I'm just saying it's not going to stop school committee members asking for stuff because they can just make a public records request if they feel if sure. a school yeah. committee member makes a public records request and that's what they want to do it's extremely telling and that's what you go ahead and do yeah. so i think you know let your subcommittees ask for stuff you know? uh through the chair through the, through chair, the chair. chair what's what's stopping you from going to the chair why, why wouldn't you get to the chair my point of view is that it slows down the conversation that if you have to wait two weeks or more by going to the chair so the way that so the way I've been handling for instance for b and w is if there's a request that I'm making what I do is I make the request in writing to Brooke but I CC Lorraine yeah so that Lorraine's in on the loop with that and then if she's got some sort of feedback about that and says yeah you know I don't like that or whatever what <laughs> then she's you know gonna get that feedback or you know whatever but she's she's in the loop on the thing so i'm not out there doing things on our behalf that no one else in the school committee knows you or know vice versa. that's yeah. that's where my thought process was behind behind yeah. that okay any other conversation on the but thank you for this no, work no it's just so i'll make these changes and we can't we can't vote till till i come to you with right. something you say is perfect right. and then we can vote the next time right okay. so hopefully it'll happen before okay. Thank you for everything that you've done. This is huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, intramural sports, and we're almost you know there. What? Sure, and this is just going to be uh, just a quick, I don't think we are going to need even 10 minutes. Um, Tanya and I had some really rich discussion on this after our last meeting, and I, I think that I, well, I know I speak for, for her as well as myself when I say that I really, and she really disagrees with the notion of introducing any type of pay for play for intramural sports. Uh, for a lot of kids, it's the only place they will get sports. And I just think that it's really going to disadvantage children. And it really feeds Mark into your thinking about, you know, we should, just shouldn't be charging. So I'm, I'm putting out there right now that I do not agree with charging any type of fee for intramural sports. I'm good with that. You guys, how do you feel? Yep. 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 Yes. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. That's great. So Thanks. committee reports, budget and warrant. Yeah, so we pretty much did it. Already. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. It was a great discussion. It was a great meeting. Yeah. Um, Kathy, personnel. Uh, we met on the 13th of November, focused on um, um, the staffing um, that is going to be put forth in the upcoming budget. So go to fill this in on some of the issues that she'd like to address in your staff. Okay. Then um, Elise. Yes, I was just checking my calendar because I wanted to tell everybody when the next CPAC meeting is because I think it's February. <coughs> February? Possibly. Uh, there's not one in December, but um, we just had a meeting uh, November 16th where we got to hear about 
the um, from two of the, the math teachers, math and special ed teacher that are co-teaching, and they told us about the program. It's very it exciting. Annoying. It was very fun to hear about. Yeah. Um, very very quickly, they're the second year of implementation. At this point, there are there's now a, a co-taught class in each of the grades six, seven, and eight. So there's no more pull-out model of their full inclusion. Um, sure. At this point. Not all students are in a co-taught class, but there is a co-taught class in every grade. Mm -hmm. And they're moving this model into the other middle schools. The goal is also to move into co-taught English language arts. Um, the teachers that presented on it were so, had so much good to say and so many um, you know, insights and things about how it's working and what models work best with which content and which students. And they're starting to share that out with other teachers and collaborating and doing PD with each other, so it was really great to hear about. And I have the up the calendar from Isabel Wells, that's what I was I'm pulling up on my phone to see, but I think the next meeting will not be at this point until January 18th is the next meeting at seven o'clock, and that will be in the high school. So people should make sure they go, because it's lots of fun to get to hear about in depth all the programs that are happening in special ed. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Any correspondence of no? Um, have everyone's reviewed the meeting minutes of November 8th, 2017, the warrants of November 24th, 2017. We'll assume those are all set. Items for next meeting. Okay. Um, Next meeting, we're going to take a look at the preliminary budget that PASS is going to bring forward. Um, we also have a UMass presentation um, on vaping and jeweling, which I think we should really encourage everybody to listen to. Um, we will um, be bringing forward, hopefully, maybe, the Unit A contract. We will be. Um, <laughs> and um, I think that's it. And that's, that's pretty much it. So I think with that, we are good to go. Um, and we are going to go into executive session, but we will not be returning to open session because it would have an impact, negative impact on the district. So um, can we move? would someone please do that? I move that we adjourn the regular meeting and enter into an executive session to we discuss draft executive session minutes of November 8, 2017. As an open meeting, they have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares. Thank you. Okay. Second. Thank you, Mark. Um, um, can you want to roll call? Um, Lorraine. Yeah. Elise. Yes. Steve. Yes. Lynn. Confirmation system. Mm -hmm. Mark. Yes. Kathy. Yes. Yeah. yes. Neil. Yes. Yeah. Not yeah. mechanicals, but yeah. Yeah, the mechanicals. All right. Good. Thank you. To do it in the field. He's going to actually.